starting now, members. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Just to let you know, we are now live and the meeting has begun. So I'm going to start by welcoming everyone to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's Planning Committee, albeit being held in a City Council venue at the Guildhall. Um, so welcome everyone and I thank you very much for, your, for taking the, the time to come to Central Cambridge this morning. I uh, appreciate it. South Cams, but uh, obviously necessary being the fact that our council chamber is being updated at the moment. Um, so my name is Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm usually the vice chair of this planning committee, but given the fact that the regular chair, Councillor Halings, is unavailable today, I will be taking the chair for this meeting. Um, given that, we do need to appoint a vice chair for the meeting. So if I can have uh, committee's affirmation, I would like to ask Councillor Peter Fain uh, to take the vice chair for the meeting. Is that agreeable with members? There's a grumble of agreement there. So Peter, if you'd like to <laughs> make your way up to the top table. Okay, whilst Councillor Fain is getting ready, I'm just going to run through a few quick housekeeping rules. Um, and can everyone present in the chamber know that we are on camera today, so please be aware that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast live at some point, so please do be aware of that. The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a few seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up with them. Uh, if the fire alarm sounds, then please do leave the chamber immediately and exit the building through the nearest emergency exit. The assembly point is at the junction of Great St Mary's and King's Parade. Further information on this exact location is in the packs that Democratic Services officers have emailed around to us before the meeting. Um, please can those members who are participating in the live stream, please indicate you wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for anything other than requests to speak. Please ensure you have switched off or silenced any other devices, devices you have so that to address the meeting please make sure your microphone is switched on when you've finished addressing the meeting please turn your microphone off immediately please note members if we have to vote on any item we should do so via the microphones it's the same system that we usually have in in Camborne so there shouldn't be any surprises there and only those members of the committee present in the chamber today are able to vote Committee members present in the chamber, um, because this, the system here is slightly different, our names don't appear on screen when our microphones are on, so I'm going to have to do very quick introductions if that's okay with everybody. Um, so I'm now going to go around the, the members who are present in the chamber, and if you could switch on your microphone, wait a few seconds, and then briefly introduce yourself, please. So as mentioned, I'm Councillor Henry Batchelor, I'm usually the Vice Chair for this committee. Uh, Councillor Fain, please. Peter Fain, Shelford Ward, I appear to be the Vice Chair. Very observant, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Martin Kahn. Councillor Martin Kahn, Member for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park. Thank you very much. Councillor Claire Daunton. I'm Councillor Claire Daunton, one of the members for the Fen Ditton and Fullbourne Ward, substituting today for Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Welcome. Uh, yes. Councillor Khan, can you turn off your microphone? Councillor Harvey, can you switch yours on, please? Yeah, apologies, Chair. Yeah, yeah Councillor Jeff Harvey, Bullshit Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Good morning, everyone. I'm Timmy Hawkins, Councillor for Caldicott Ward. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Ripper. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councillor Judith Griffith, um, member for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Morning, my name's Heather Williams and I represent the Maldens Ward. Thank you, and Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you very much. So I confirm the meeting's core, so we're going to proceed. Uh, with us in the chamber, we also have two officers who will be supporting us. We have Mr Chris Carter on my left. Thank you, Chair. Morning, members. Chris Carter, Delivery Manager for Strategic Sites. Thank you, and we also have... This is Aaron Clark, who's helping us clerk the meeting. Aaron? Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, technical support officer for the meeting. Thank you very much. And I believe online we have Mr Rory McKenna, who's supporting us in a legal fashion. 
Uh, good morning, Chair. I am indeed until Stephen Reid takes over when he arrives. Thank you very much. Uh, and actually, we also have another um, member supporting us, Lawrence, who is our new Democratic Services Officer who's supporting the Planning Committee. Lawrence, would you like to switch your camera on and introduce yourself? Yes. Good morning, Chair. Lawrence Damari Hoban, new Dem Services, as you say. Um, and best of luck with this lengthy agenda today. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, members, just a reminder, if any member leaves the meeting at any point, would you please indicate that to me so it can be recorded in the minutes? Uh, we'll be taking regular breaks depending on where we are in the agenda, but given we have quite a lot to get through today, um, we'll have to do that as and when, but obviously I will be taking breaks to allow members time to refresh themselves. Uh, members should have the main agenda pack dated 2nd of November and also some supplementary items which were only emailed around, so we should have digital copies of those. Uh, those are both dated 5th of November and they both relate to North Stove Phase 2. Um, and also there should also be a plans, plans pack for a number of the items that we'll be discussing today. So if anyone doesn't feel they have those uh, agenda items, those um, documents, sorry, please do indicate when we get to those items. Um, okay, we're going to move on to item one on the agenda, which is chair's announcements. Um, two announcements from me. One, as I mentioned, we have a new democratic services officer supporting us, Lawrence, who just introduced himself. Obviously, that does mean that our um, previous uh, clerk who was supporting the committee, Ian Senior, is now no longer, sadly, supporting the planning committee. He hasn't left the council, but he is moving to a different role within the democratic services team. So on behalf of the committee, I'd just like to register our thanks for the many years of support that Ian's provided the planning committee um, and wish him all the well in his, in his future roles within the council. So yeah, a great thank you to Ian for all his, all his dedication. And secondly, for those that don't know, Mr. Chris Carter on my left is leaving the council. Um, I think he's only got a week or so left with us. So this is his last ever planning committee as he breathes a sigh of relief next to me. Um, yeah, Chris, how long have you been with the council? Thanks, Chair. Uh, two years, just over two years. Um, probably not my last ever plan. Uh, for, for the time being, at least. Okay. Well, again, thank you, yeah, thank you very much for myself as chair and obviously from the committee as a whole for all your support for us over those two years. It's been greatly well received and always hugely professional. So, you know, we as a committee wish you all the best in the future yeah, and hopefully see you at committee again, albeit in a different capacity. So members, we'll move on now with item two on the agenda, which is apologies. Uh, Lawrence, can we have apologies, please? Yes, Chair. So we have apologies from the usual Chair, Councillor Pippa Halings, Councillor Deborah Roberts also sends her apologies, and Councillor Eileen Wilson too with apologies, with Councillor Claire Daunton kindly substituting for Councillor Wilson. Great. Thank you very much. Item number three members is declarations of interest. So do any members have any pecuniary or non-pecuniary uh, items? Uh, Councillor Khan, please. <clears throat> With regard to the item on Barrington, I come from Barrington. Uh, 12 years ago, I um, show, gave a sideshow and information uh, to Councillor, sorry, Mr. Elihu, Elihu Lightpart and the Applicant appears to be the son. Um, I'm approaching this afresh. Okay, thank you. Councillor Daunton. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the Fenditon um, is the first item on the agenda um, about the footpath is in the uh, parish of Fenditon. Fenditon is in my ward. Um, there seems to be a letter. I'm muted, but. Sorry, sorry, technical sorry. microphone issues, members. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Can everyone online please make sure their microphones are muted, please? Okay, well, thank you, Councillor. I think we understood the, the interest anyway. Um, uh, yes, um, I have been present when there have been discussions at Parish Council, but I come to this completely afresh. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, please. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, just on the enforcement report, I'm a local member for one of the cases on there, yep. um, but it's not a decision making, but obviously have been involved in discussions around that. Great. Thank you very much. And I need to declare an interest on item five. Um, as Cambridgeshire County Councillor, the applicant, I'm also a member of Cambridgeshire County Council, as I believe Councillor Daunton, you are as well. So I think that will be noted too. Um, but obviously that doesn't preclude us from making a decision on it today. Councillor Ripeth, please. Um, on the enforcement report as well, there's a couple of um, items to do with my ward, but um, I've not been involved. Okay, that's too. fine. Noted. And Councillor Harvey, please. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm also involved in one of the items on the enforcement report. Great. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. No more declarations, so we'll move on to item four, minutes of previous meetings. Members, we have two sets of minutes to look at, starting on page one, which is the meeting on Wednesday the 29th of September. Um, members, are you content that I sign this as a correct record, or are there any alter alterations? Councillor Ripeth, please. Um, just a spelling mistake of a councillor's name on page two. Um, on declarations of interest, minute three, Councillor Corin Garvey should be C O R I N E. Are you looking? Can Sorry. Um, paragraph four, minute three, declarations oh, yes. of interest. One too many R's in there. Um, well, yeah. yeah. One, one too many R's and one too few N's. Okay. I'm sure that'll be noted and Lawrence can update that before publishing. Thank you. Um, any other, Councillor Daunton? Um, yes, on the next set of minutes, I have a point. Do you want me to Okay, take... I think we'll sign these ones off first. Members, with that small name change, is everyone content that we sign these as a correct record? Just a mumble of affirmation would be yes. fine. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we move on to the second set of minutes, which is from Wednesday the 13th of October. Again, same question, members. Any... Uh, any alter alterations, Councillor Daunton? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, on page eight, um, under point six, uh, the first paragraph, uh, myself and Councillor John Williams also spoke on that occasion, and I can't see that we were represented there. So Councillor John Williams and Councillor Dr Claire Daunton uh, were both speakers. Okay. Lawrence, I'm sure that can be included in the minutes when they're published, please. Any further amendments to this set of minutes, members? No. Okay, so with that one that one addition, are members okay to agree these minutes is correct? Agreed. Agreed? Good. Thank you very much. We will then move on to substantive items of business on the agenda, starting with item number five, which is a footpath diversion in Fenditton. Members, this is on page 13 of our agendas. Uh, the applicant is Cambridgeshire County Council, and we have Mr. James Stringer, who's the definitive maps officer at the County Council, to present the item to us today. James, good morning. Good morning. And yeah, if you could present the item, please. Yeah, this um, this agenda item is regarding an application for a um, public path order under Section 257 of the, of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. Um, that particular section, being under the Town and Country Planning Act, um, allows South Cambridgeshire District Council as the local planning authority to make um, Good. Apologies James, sorry would you mind starting again I'm not sure how much yeah, yeah. The people watching That's online caught of that yeah, um, this agenda item is regarding an application for a public path order under Section 257 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. Section 257 the team's meeting screen, so I believe people watching online will only be able to hear what's being said rather than see anything, but, um, but I'm content to carry on like that. So, James, for the third time, <laughs> apologies if you wouldn't mind starting again with the item, please. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, this agenda item is regarding an application for a public path order under Section 257 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. Uh, Section 257 allows South Cambridgeshire District Council, as the local highway authority, uh, local planning authority, sorry, to make a public path order to divert or stop up a public right of way if they are satisfied that it is necessary to do so to enable a development to be carried out. 
It also allows for the creation of an alternative path as a replacement for the one proposed to be stopped up. The report for the committee this morning is relate in relation to the Marley development off Newmarket Road in the parish of Fendidden. As part of the development proposals, Hill, via their agents PlanServe, have applied for a public path order affecting Fendidden public footpath number nine. Historically, public footpath number nine ran from a point on Newmarket Road between the park and ride and the BP garage and, you, and ran in a northerly direction across what was arable land to the disused railway line. This is shown between points um, A to E on the plan uh, appendix E of the report. The applicant's assertion in their application is that the existing public footpath is required to be stopped up to allow the permitted development to be carried out. As part of the application for a public path order, the applicant also proposes to provide an alternative path as a replacement. The applicant has proposed that the replacement path be a more inclusive status of a public bridleway and would and would follow generally the perimeter of the development site. This is shown between points F, G, H, J, K, L and E on the plan. Just briefly going through the report, section two of the report presents some further background on the matter. Um, section three provides a description of the existing and proposed paths, while sections four and five sets out the legal framework for today's decision along with the relevant council policies. It should also be noted that are, there are various other paths which the applicant has agreed to provide as part of the development proposals that are anticipated to become public bridal ways as well. As these dedications of new bridal, bridal ways are not linked to any existing public rights of way, it is not possible for them to be considered under the Town and Country Planning Act and are therefore not part of today's decision. These paths are being considered separately by the County Council under provisions contained within the Highways Act 1980. The remaining sections of the report sets out the responses received during consultation and an assessment of the proposal against the legislative framework and council policies. The Assistant Director of Highway Maintenance at the County Council, being the position with delegated powers, confirmed on the 20th of September of this year that the proposed alternative route would be acceptable to the County Council as local highway authority. Therefore, the decision to be considered today by the committee is whether it is necessary to make a public path order affecting public footpath number nine, Fenditton, to enable the development as approved to be carried out. Following a consideration of the proposal, the officer's recommendation, as set out in section 10, is that a public path order is necessary and that an order should be made by South Cambridgeshire District Council under section 257 of the Town and Country Planning Act, subject to the inclusion of some necessary information regarding widths. Thank you. Is on this member, so I'm going to go straight into the debate on this. And obviously, if there's any questions for James, now is the opportunity to ask. Councillor Khan. Um, the uh, proposal is to, to create a bridleway, but a section of the route is planned to be only two metres wide. How do you, how does it plan to cope for the different uses on that uh, on a site which is so narrow? Will there not it would not be possible to have a separate area for for horses and for pedestrians, for instance, or for cycles, for instance, which are also allowed to use the bridleway? James. Yeah, there are some sections of the um, proposed path which are proposed to be two metres wide. Um, they are sections of the path that will run parallel with um, asphalted routes that are being provided as part of other phases of the development and are subject to Section 38 adoptions through the Highway Authority. So in reality, what you would have on the ground is a three metre or four metre wide asphalt um, cycleway, if that's what you would like to call it, plus this two metre wide bridleway alongside it, which would provide the additional rights for equestrians. So in reality, you would end up with a um, five or six metre wide non motorised user corridor um, split in terms of surface and status. The only being provided two metre width for horses, claiming that wasn't sufficient. James? Yeah, um, so that, that um, the comments of, of the British Horse Society, they, they were consulted um, in this particular application um, and actually they were fairly heavily involved through the planning process of the of the 
um, permitted development as well, and they didn't raise, it, raise any objections in this particular matter. Members, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Just on the on the point of the bridal way, I think part of the problem is if you've got multi-use and two metres isn't sufficient for all those purposes. But as it seems to be that there's the two metres and the other area, because the problem is the horses can't go on, on the asphalt, but they can, two metres for the horses should be fine. Um, I'm pleased that actually that's been included and looked at, something that's often overlooked. Um, so happy to support it. Indeed. Thank you very much. I don't see any, no further speakers, members. So can I take it we can go to the recommendation, which is on page 21, but it's hidden by the blue strip at the bottom of the page, <laughs> quite unhelpfully. Uh, it's section 10 of the County Council's report, if that helps anyone. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to read the entire recommendation, but you can see it in front of you there. Members, I haven't heard any dissent to this, so can I take this by affirmation, please? Agreed. Does anybody not agree? No. No abstentions? No. Okay. So that is approved. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, James. Thank you. So, members, we'll move on to item six, which is on page 81. Thank you. And this is an application on the land north and east of Rampt Hill Farm, Rampton Road, Cottenham. The proposal is for the approval of matters reserved in respect of appearance, landscaping, layout and scale, following an outline permission for residential development of 140 dwellings. We have a list of key material considerations in our agendas, members. Um, and the application is here because Cotton and Parish Council requested that the application was heard by the planning committee. The recommendation is approval. The, uh, the presenting officer is Michael Sexton, who I'm hoping is with us online. Michael? I am. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Um, Councillor Goff, if you could turn your camera off for a second, please. You will be called upon later. Thank you. <laughs> and Michael, if you'd like to give us any updates and then present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there's just the one um, update. A representation was sent to Democratic Services on the 4th of November. Um, I don't propose to read it in full because it is um, more or less a duplication of representations that are received during the course of the application and raise no new issues. Um, but just to highlight, it's a representation in, in respect of, of feeling the number of houses and roadways on the site is too high, location of attenuation ponds, location for leap, um, concerns around planting, um, cycle routes to Lambs Lane and Les Kingwood, all, all of those issues uh, were raised during the consultation period and have been addressed in the report, so I don't propose to read the page um, in full, if that's okay, Chair. Yeah, that's fine. So I'll move on to my presentation. Chair, if you could confirm that uh, you're able to see a, a PowerPoint on screen now. Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, yes, so this is an application, sorry, I thought this was reading. Uh, a reserve mass application for 140 dwellings with matters of appearance, landscaping, layout and scale, following an outline permission for residential development on Rampton Road, Cottenham. Um, members may well recall this site, it is one that's been to members before, but just for context, it's located on sort of the western edge of Cottenham, um, heading out towards Rampton, further to the west. Um, there was an outline consent was allowed at appeal in uh, on the 10th of May, 2018 for 154 dwellings. Um, that application was later subject to a non-material amendment which revised the description to say up to 154 dwellings. Um, of key relevance to the reserve mass application, there are three conditions on the outline consent. Um, condition five requiring a precautionary working methodology and um, to be submitted in terms of biodiversity and habitats that has been submitted and found acceptable as part of this reserve mass application. Uh, condition six required details of housing mix, including affordable housing to be provided. That is has been done and is in the report and again found to be acceptable. Um, condition seven related to the potential for the layout of the site to build over any existing pitches. They would then have to be reprovided. Um, the layout doesn't do so, so there's no need for any pitches to be reprovided because none are lost as part of this proposal. Um, 
in terms of the application boundary, uh, again, this red line boundary here is the reserve matters boundary. It has been reduced slightly from the outline consent, which I've tried to highlight as this dashed line. So this section here in green is, is no longer part of the reserve matters proposal. That's because Cambridgeshire County Council have retained this parcel of land for future expansion of the school and land that's to be leased to the parish council. But the reserve matters uh, site is entirely within, um, wholly within the, the agreement of the outline boundaries. So there's no issues in that respect. Again, that's just to show the, the site in relation to the existing village. Um, just a few views. It is very much as you uh, probably expect a fairly open, relatively flat, um, undeveloped area of land that joins the recreation ground. Um, does slope down slightly into Leskin Wood, which bounds the western boundary of the site. Relevant planning history, um, if members can recall in October 2020, um, an application, reserve matters application was considered by the committee for approval of appearance, landscape, layout and scale for 147 dwellings. That was refused by the planning committee for two reasons. Um, the first being the proposed dwellings by virtue of their excessive scale height mass and design would be harmful to the character of the area, uh, contrary to local plan policies and neighbourhood plan policies. And then the second reason uh, related to the number of dwellings and their siting um, interfering with a vista towards All Saints Church from Rampton Road, contrary to Cottenham neighbourhood plan. That decision was subject to an appeal, um, which was dismissed in July of this year, and both of those reasons were upheld. So this application for members today very much seeks to address those reasons. Um, for refusal and officers are satisfied that the proposal does indeed um, address those reasons. So this is the proposed layout of 140 dwellings, 84 are market units, uh, 56 are affordable, which is 40% of the development. Uh, in terms of the second reason for refusal, there is a vista in the neighbourhood plan, got the neighbourhood plan uh, from sort of this area uh, of Rampton Road, which looks across the, the site over the fields to uh, All Saints Church, which is a couple of kilometres further to the north. It, it might not be too clear on this plan, but there is a dashed line, um, which is where the developer has superimposed the vista from the neighbourhood plan onto the layout of the site. And you can see that the built form is, has been stepped away from further away from Les Kingwood to allow these open views to be retained. So we're satisfied in terms of layout that that vista has been retained and the parish council haven't raised any objections in that regard. Uh, just to highlight to members, the distribution of affordable housing is, is distributed well through the site. It's in line um, with uh, the Great Cambridge Housing Strategy and the Council's housing team are happy, so there's no objections from officers in terms of the distribution and the mix of affordable housing that's being provided. Um, in terms of scale and appearance, again, re referring back to the previous refusal, um, the first reason for refusal being excessive height and scale of the dwellings, introducing a discordance appearance. Uh, previously, the ridge heights, as set out in paragraphs 149 and 151 of the report, the previous scheme has refused had ridge heights ranging between 9 and 10 metres, whereas the application for members today is sort of between 8.2 and 8.8. .8. So it is it is reduced um, and the, the angle of the pitches is, is, is much more traditional and in keeping with the, the village. So these are just to show a mixture of, of house types. There's a range of house types within the layout and that's to uh, add interest and variety and avoid the repetition of, of house types, um, which you can sort of see convey that you don't really have house types of the same um, design or material palette next to each other too often, uh, which is a positive response to the design uh, Cotton Neighbourhood Plan. Um, these are just some examples of some of the house types. It's a very typical two storey um, development throughout the site. Um, these are part of the plans back, so you would have seen these already. And then this is the, the apartment buildings. They've got a ridge height of 7.4. That's a reduction of 1.2 metres to what was proposed um, on the application that was refused. Um, in terms of landscape, landscaping is there's actually a condition on the outline that will secure the detailed planting um, for the, the application. But hopefully this gives a sense that there's a, a, a central green space to the site, which is which is positive feature. The leap is actually being located on the edge of the site rather than rather than in the middle. And we feel that gives a good connection to the adjacent recreation ground. Um, hopefully members can see there's a lot of additional planting going in along 
some of the key roads and a lot of permeability through the site into Leskin Wood. Again, that's a positive response to the requirements of the neighbourhood plan. Um, so there's a lot of planting going in, the details of which are reserved by condition on the outline consent and will come forward through a discharge conditions application. Uh, so quite a few things to consider. Uh, compliance with the outline planning permission. Again, officers are satisfied. It, it ticks the boxes in that respect. Housing provision, open space. The, the four reserve matters, biodiversity, flood risk and drainage. Um, on flood risk and drainage, I would say there is a condition on the outline consent that requires a full drainage scheme to come forward, including man, uh, management and maintenance details, but for the purposes of the reserve matters application in consultation with the relevant technical consultees, including the internal drainage board, um, officers satisfied that the, the layout of the site can deliver a suitable drainage scheme. Um, highway safety and management of roads. The highways authority have said they won't adopt um, parts of the site in its current form, um, but there is potential for the developer to bring forward more information through the relevant agreement with the highways authority that could result in, in more of the development being adopted. There is a condition recommended as part of the reserve matters application that just deals with the potential for lack of adoption. Uh, residential immunity and heritage assets. So overall, as set out in the report, officers are, are satisfied that the uh, proposal is compliant with those key issues and um, policies of the local plan and the neighbourhood plan and is therefore recommended for approval. Um, and just to stress that we really do feel it has addressed the previous reasons for refusal. Thank you, Chair. Michael, thank you very much. Um, if you could hold on the line, uh, we've got a few public speakers, but we will be, I'm sure, coming back to you for questions and some members may wish to see some um, elements of your report again. So if you could have that on hand, ready to display again, that'd be useful. So yeah. members will move. Oh, it's probably worth for the minutes noting that Mr. Stephen Reid has now arrived at the meeting. So Rory, if you're online, thank you very much for stepping in. We, you weren't needed, thankfully, but we appreciate you stepping in at short notice. Um, I'm going to move on to public speakers now, members. We have one member of the public, first of all, Mr. Mike Mason. If you'd like to come forward, Mr. Mason. Um, just the microphone straight ahead of you. Thank you. So the button on the right-hand side activates and turns off the microphone. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the process, we allow public each speaker three minutes to address the committee. And then there may be some questions of clarity for you at the end. So if you could stay seated when you finish, that'll be helpful. Whenever you're ready, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm here as a resident of Cottenham. Uh, in fact, I live not far from the site in a listed building, which is mentioned actually in the, in the officer's report. Um, in accepting the principle of development at this site has been conceded by the authority with outline permission being granted at appeal against its former decisions, I would express deep concern that a number of important conditions appear to have been ignored in the latest report. This is a very large development to be imposed upon a rural settlement incorporating low-lying land, much of which lies at or below sea level, and as such, the applicants must have careful regard to existing infrastructure. Any development proposal must therefore not only avoid the possibility of flooding on the site, but importantly, should not increase the risk of flooding downstream. It is disappointing to note from the officer's report that members have not had the benefit of a site visit. Turning to the report on paragraph 203, full details of the surface and foul water drainage strategy have not been provided for public consultation and residents of Cottenham reserve the right to question the feasibility of these proposals, notwithstanding the apparent, apparent acceptance of other consultees. Foul drainage in the village has been problematical for many years, and Anglian Water Services are currently engaged in a major scheme of upgrading and relining of the 50-year-old foul clay drain network in the high street. 
the doubling of the number of dwellings served by the Rampton Road Fowl Sewer via a pumped rising main, paragraph 306, could well result in unacceptable risk to the free flow in the gravity system and reliability of the units at the Broad Lane pumping station, which has superseded the original local sewage treatment works. Furthermore, it is not stated whether there is an agreement or provision for emergency discharge consent in the event of pump failure, either at the new pumping station or the existing Broad Lane installation. In view of the sensitivity of this issue, local residents need to be given absolute assurance contained within a discharge of conditions application with regard to management of the foul drainage system in the event of pump failure by the use of tankers to transport untreated effluent to the main treatment works at Milton. Could I ask you to wrap up your comments, This happens please, frequently at Histon. Restriction of sewage discharge to watercourses is an important environmental matter currently being pursued in Parliament. Are we coming towards the that end, That being Mason? said, members should consider whether this is the case. Whether, in this case, the hitherto undisputed right of developers to connect to existing Mr. under Mason, capacity... Mr we've, we've had three minutes now, please. Could you conclude, if possible, please? Sorry? Could you conclude your comments, please? We've had the allotted time. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, con I'll conclude, Chairman. Uh, uh, the, my representation is about conditions which needs to be uh, uh, taken into account by the planning committee. I therefore would urge the committee to defer the application and uh, until all discharge conditions applications are received and have been out for consultation and members have had the opportunity to visit the site. This is important for Cottenham. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. Uh, members, do we have any questions of clarity for Mr. Mason? Mm, no? Okay. Thank you very much for coming here today and addressing the committee, Mr. Mason. We'll move on now to our next speaker, which is Mr. James Griffith. Mr. Griffith, if you'd like to come forward as well, please. Same microphone. Uh, Mr Griffith, I believe you're the agent for the applicant, is that correct? Uh, yes, Mr Chairman, uh, I'm James Griffiths, uh, Head of Planning at Tilia Homes, who were formerly Clear Living. Thank you very much. So, yeah, same procedure as before, three minutes to address the committee, then there may be some questions of clarification for you at the end. Okay, so, you. whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. Uh, I hope through our discussions and meetings over the past few months with the Parish Council, local councillors and your officers, that we've shown our commitment to securing an attractively designed scheme which responds to the needs of Cotton community. From the outset, our application reduced the number of houses we were proposing from the 154 number that were approved in outline to the present proposal of 140. Our aim for the application was also to maximise the amount of deliverable open space that could be linked to the existing Cotton and playing fields whilst at the same time respecting the key vista to the All Saints Church spire that the neighbourhood plan highlighted. The retention of this vista also enabled the housing development to be set much further back from Les King Wood, ensuring that the setting of the wood is respected and enhanced. We've also spent some time satisfying the lead flood authority over the drainage strategy. With our calculations... Apologies, Mr Griffith, I've got people waving at me. Uh, yes, um, I can't hear terribly well, and I think um, uh, one of the members of the public can't hear. If you could speak up slightly or speak closer into the microphone. Okay. okay. Well, did you did you miss most of that? What the Mr. Griffith was saying. Um, I'll start again with. If that's yeah, if, if that's possible, if you could lead into the microphone as well, so everyone can yeah, hear you clearly. That yeah, that's, be that's better, isn't it? Okay, so if we start again, um, please. That'd be great. Um, we've also spent some time satisfying the lead flood authority over the drainage strategy, with our calculations showing that the system does not flood in the one in one hundred year plus climate change event the water being rooted into four attenuation basins, which have been significantly enlarged from early proposals. We understand that the drainage strategy is acceptable to the LLFA, although additional details will follow with our condition discharge submission. 
We do, however, acknowledge that the Parish Council has raised some outstanding points in relation to the application, which I'd like to highlight. With regard to the house type design, during the course of the application, we met with and secured feedback from the design enabling panel and took on board both comments from them and from your urban design officer, altering the proposed materials, elevational features and window openings. Should we secure approval, we are required to continue dialogue with your planning authority concerning the type of materials employed and feel that this will enable the scheme to meet the parish's expectations in design terms. The parish were disappointed about our proposed primary source of heating for the scheme and whilst we're intending at least in the short term to serve the development with gas heating, we will be providing solar PV panels for a high proportion of the houses, as well as employing construction details, which will enable an overall reduction in carbon emissions. The Parish Council also raised concern with regard to the use of shared and adopted roads, and whilst it's our intention to secure adoption for as much of the road surfacing as possible, where the design requires shorter informal roads in locations that respond to the lower density housing overlooking Leskin Wood, we have adopted the Council's approach to shared access roads. In these instances, if the roads are not adopted, we'll ensure uh, the maintenance of such roads is appropriately managed through a management company, which will retain a legally secure fund in perpetuity to the maintenance of the roads. Finally, the parish have expressed a desire to improve footpath access to the primary school and Lambs Lane, which is an objective that we're also seeking for our proposed future residents. Should you approve of the application, we'll be able to move forward on a meeting between the county landowners and the parish to discuss such a link to our site. If you are able to secure your support for the development, we'll be able to progress the building of 56 affordable dwellings, 70% of which will be affordable rent. 1.6 million of the Section 106 agreement contributions, including 314,000 for local recreational provision, as well as ensuring that a robust management regime is in place for those King Wood. I therefore hope that you'll be able to support our current proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very timely as well. Um, if you wouldn't mind staying seated for the moment, Mr Griffith, there may be some questions of clarity, and I see we have one straight off the bat. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my question is to do with uh, heating for the new houses, bearing in mind that gas boilers are going to be phased out in 2025 onwards. I um, don't know what your plans will be if you did get planning permission when you'll be building this out, but don't you think you should be looking forward even more than just solar panels and use heat pumps? Because we're building for the future here. We are looking at that as a company, but it's a company-wide approach, and we haven't concluded what's the best route to go down. I think there are still um, teething problems with air source heat pumps, so we are sort of investigating that. And I think initially we just want to make sure um, that our purchasers have uh, a choice, potentially. But uh, I'm not ruling out definitely alternative heating arrangements, certainly in the later part of the development. Thank you. Um, Councillor Khan, please. <coughs> Provision being made uh, for electric car charging points in, in the new developments. Uh, it, nothing has been shown on these particular plans, so we would respond to a condition discharge in that instance, if there's a requirement. But I don't think it's policy at the moment, but I'm, I'm sure. No, it's all, I'm just being told it's also not a reserve matter at this stage. Councillor Daunton, please. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, can I just follow up on the point that Councillor Hawkins has made about the, um, the heating? Um, you said that there were teething problems with air source heat pumps. Um, many of us have installed them. I'm, I'm not sure what the teething problems would be. Well, I felt it was just quite early on. I, as, a, as a company, I think we're looking for a sort of company-wide response, and uh, our head office hasn't sort of concluded what the best route is for heating for our houses. So, um, you know, I think it's still early days in, in air source heat pump design, um, and uh, I think they're looking at various alternatives. So it's just not been concluded yet as to what the best route is. Thank you. Councillor Fain. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, early days in air source heat pump design. I'm not sure whether that is really the case now, but that may be so. And as, as pointed out, it's not a reserved matter. Just wondering whether 
you're able to say that uh, there will be space for, for instance, if, air, if ground source heat pumps were to be considered in the future, um, because otherwise we're looking at design of new developments um, with new gas boilers being phased out within five years. Is there going to be space um, for such things to be considered? I think air source heat pump probably is the way forward rather than um, the, the ground version. Uh, and uh, there is the ability to retrofit uh, on earlier uh, elements if they haven't had that form of heating established. So we, we can accommodate that. And certainly if our purchasers uh, early on would want that approach, we'd be able to um, fit them into the scheme. Thank you. Councillor Ripeth, please. Um, I don't want to labour the point that people have already mentioned, but to retrofit, as I'm sure you know, is a lot more expensive than to just go with the right thing in the first place. And we're talking, this is now 2021, and the date is 2025, and I'm afraid it doesn't quite wash with me. I think just to clarify this point, I'll, I'll turn over to Chris quickly, just to clarify the heating. Point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my understanding is there's a condition on the outline planning commission which deals with this matter. So the applicant will be uh, required to provide those details and have them agreed by the council. So uh, my advice would be it's not a matter for this reserve matters application. It's a matter that will be considered when the, those details are provided for the discharge of condition. Thank, Thank you, Chair. You. Uh, Councillor Harvey, please. In that case, I'm not sure whether my point is valid, but I just wanted to make the point um, also as somebody whose house is heated by an air source heat pump uh, very effectively, but also to make the point that that's only one side of the coin because um, to the extent that there are teething problems, uh, which I think probably um, a lot of people would disagree with, um, if there are, it might be because um, the heat demand is too high. Um, is there a question course, for the agent? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and so the question is... Um, are the, um, is, is the fabric and the heat loss um, designed to be um, exceeding the building regulations or is it just the bare minimum um, that you can insist on? Which I think is building regs part L. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we would be exceeding it because there is a, a, a condition that requires us to um, reduce carbon by a further 10%, I think, over and above building um, regulation requirements. So, yeah, there would be an enhancement. But no ambition beyond the minimum within the current um, planning regime uh, and the current local plan, if you like. Um, not, not beyond policy requirement at the moment, no, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. This, this may be... Uh, I, say, I don't want to lay the point, and I take Mr Carter's ad advice about the different conditions, but um, normally, or quite often, with um, new buildings new houses, they're sold on plan. So I'd just like to seek reassurance that um, options would be given so that if the purchaser wanted, they could almost choose the type of um, heating that they would like rather than the retrofit option. Um, and I'll take guidance as to whether I've um, been disobedient to our advice and, and asked an inappropriate question, Chair. But I'm just wondering if that was something that um, the agent would consider Sure. Doing. Uh, Mr. Griffith, do you have a response to that? I imagine it's probably no. Um, well, I'm, I'm kind of delving into sales um, issues, really, which sure. I'm a little bit reluctant to do. Um, sure. You know, I, I think if, if a resident came to us and asked us specifically that they would want that sort of approach, then I think we would accommodate it. No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, again, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me come back and through you. Um, one of the concerns raised by the Parish Council is the large number of unadopted roads um, in this proposed development. And I must admit it is a bugbear of mine as well, um, because the upshot of having a management company uh, looking after uh, infrastructure in a new development is additional tax burden on homeowners who already pay council tax. And sometimes we know these management companies go bust. 
Um, can you tell us the proportion of unadopted roads that you're proposing in this development? And why on earth wouldn't you actually build the development so that the roads can be adopted by the Highways Authority? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Griffin. Yes, I mean, we feel the same. We want to minimise the amount of roads that aren't adopted, and that hasn't been decided yet. That would form part of a condition discharge. We would push as much as possible for the counties to adopt all the roads, and there's no reason why they wouldn't, other than private drives, because uh, it, they're designed in accordance with their design guide and, and design brief. So we, we would be pushing the county to adopt as much of the roads as possible, um, notwithstanding private drives would still be um, maintained by uh, potentially the management company. But to reassure you, we, we do have a lot of experience of, of management companies and, and the structure is, uh, they, they, uh, whilst the company might go bust, there's a, there's a legal regime in place which uh, ring fences the money that residents pay, which is completely separate to those companies. So we use that, we've got a site at Willingham um, with this arrangement where um, you know, a company could go bust, but the residents manage the management company eventually, and that maintains the, the, the payment securely on a legal basis. So there isn't any danger of that. Um, but yes, it's certainly our intention to get as much of the road surface uh, adopted as possible. And the only reason we're not is that we think that probably the shared, some of the shared roadways they won't adopt near Les King Wood, but that's an informal design approach to what we're doing. Thank you for that. Um, members, did you want to come back? Sorry, what proportion of the roads will be unadopted in this proposal? I, I don't think we know that yet. Um, what, what we'll do, uh, condition discharge and um, uh, the Section 38 agreement that the company will apply for, we'll only really know at that stage. We'll push for all the roads to, to be adopted um, 100%, but it's, it's up to the county when they come back and they may say, well, we don't want to, we don't want to adopt um, the shared drives, which would make up probably a quarter, potentially, of the roads on the scheme. Um, so I, I had a guess. But I, I'm hoping that all of them, and they should be, most authorities, most county councils, adopt um, shared roads in these sorts of situations. So I'm not quite clear why um, this particular county doesn't. But um. Thank you. Uh, if there's no more... One more, Councillor Carl. <laughs> um, I don't know whether again it would be considered uh, not relevant, but when you come to the, uh, um, you talk about not being possible to use ground source heat, ground source heat pumps, um, the, uh, that seems to me that it might be a possibility when you come to consider the conditions um, uh, of your heating availability, consider, because the site is actually on green sand, which is a, per a permeable rock. And therefore, it might be a feasible possibility. But if you do that, you would need to have, um, it would need to be a, a, a communal system rather than an individual system. Is there a question? Uh, will there be provision, a possibility uh, at a later date when you do the conditions to consider uh, for the installation of communal, a communal supply if necessary? I think uh, we don't, um, we've got very little experience of communal heating systems. It could be applicable uh, to the flatted element of the scheme. But I think there could be problems. I mean, it, it, I haven't really explored that, and it, and it could pull, form part of the management company arrangements who would be looking after the open space if the heating arrangement is in the open space. But it's... It, it, it's okay. Uh, in another, thank you. Okay. In Councillor Cohn. Councillor, thank you. I was going to come in and ask Mr Reid to give us a legal view. Right, hand button. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to bring members' attention to paragraph 711, little 2, of the section 106 agreements attached to the outline permission. There it provides that each of the residents will be responsible for ongoing maintenance of the LEAP and other on-site public open space if the management company or other third party were to cease to exist or otherwise fail to properly maintain the LEAP or other on-site public open space. I acknowledge that it doesn't extend to management of the roads, but as the residents will have an incentive to ensure that the management company stays alive, because otherwise the liability passes to them, then I think there is some assurance that the management, through the management company, is, is robust. But um, 
I would also add that, in my experience, the question of whether the estate roads are to be adopted or not is not a material consideration for the purposes of a refusal. Perhaps Mr Carter would like to endorse that. Thanks, Chair. Yes, I agree with that advice. OK, thank you. And on, and on the heating issue, I think we've got as much information out of the agent at this stage as we possibly can. So I would like to, uh, to move on to the final speaker on this item, please, which is Councillor Neil Goff, who's one of the local members and I'm hoping is still online. Councillor Goff? Yep. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, before I start, can I just declare two non-pecuniary interests, please? Um, I'm the um, a director of uh, this land, uh, which was the company which sold the the land to, to Keir Living and subsequently became Tilia Homes. Uh, just to be clear, that sale took place prior to me being a director of the company. Um, and secondly, I'm the, a board member of the Old West River Internal Drainage Board. Um, the relevance of that will become clear in my comments. Um, but I speak as a local member uh, on this on this matter. Um, the Parish Council uh, are not uh, speaking today, but they have seen my comments in advance and they concur with them. As I'm sure you're aware, you have three minutes to address the committee and then there may be some questions of clarification for yourself. So if you could just stay on the line for a couple more minutes at the end, whenever you're ready. Sure. Okay. Many of you will be aware of the controversial nature of this application, which was a five-year housing land supply site initially refused by this committee, but then unfortunately lost upon appeal. That set in train what has been a very long process of trying to make the best out of a bad job. The last time you saw this, application was this site was a reserve matters application prior to the sale to Tilia Homes. That previous reserve matters application was refused by this committee. The application was not compliant to policies in the neighbourhood plan and numerous other concerns were raised which on their own may not have been uh, reasons for refusal but were significant for the community. I'm pleased to report that these issues have been largely addressed to the satisfaction of the parish and the local members uh, by Tilia Homes. I would also like to express my appreciation and that of the parish for Tilia Homes, who have demonstrated a willingness to listen and adapt their scheme to reflect the concerns of the parish and the local members. They have been uh, good partners in this, and I, I hope that continues as, uh, as this development can, can proceed. Uh, the lesson for this, from this application is that there is real value in striving for better. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that the commi this committee and the officers have had a big role to play in that achievement because this scheme is a lot better than what we have seen before. Serious concerns, however, do remain about the drainage scheme raised by Mr Mason and the Parish Council given the importance of drainage conditions in this outline application to Cotman. It is really important that the scheme performs not just on day one, but is maintained, maintained appropriately into the future. That requires financial and legal agreements on the provision of long-term maintenance of drainage systems to be repassed, particularly in this case, given the impact on the adjoining and very popular Les King Wood which is also local green space. Therefore, I would ask that the parish and the Old West River Drain Internal Drainage Board in particular are afforded the opportunity to bring their local experience to bear at the time that this condition is considered for discharge. Lastly, um, it is to be hoped that some form of direct linkage for cycling and walking could be established from this development to the village, the core of the village, via the primary school. Absent this, you will unfortunately approve today a largely car dependent development. It's simply too far from the village core to be anything other than that. We have a meeting next week uh, with the county council, the parish council and Tilia Homes. And we very much hope that we can craft a solution to this. That would be good news for everyone not least the future residents of this development. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. 
Uh, questions of clarity for the councillor. Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll stick to the, the drainage issue by yourself, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, because obviously it's a reserve matters application, and um, Mr Carter will shake his head at me if I'm wrong, but my understanding um, is very much that we need to be satisfied that a solution could be made possible and that the condition will then deal with the practicalities. So I'm just wondering um, if Councillor Goff um, would be able to give his opinion that a scheme for the drainage could be found possible. It might not be what you're looking, you don't agree with what we're sort of being shown at the moment, but is it possible in your opinion for a, for a condition to be discharged and for that to be able to be met? And then I'm just wondering, given the concerns um, substantive concerns that have been raised on the issue, whether it would give more assurance if we were to say that the condition would come for, in relation to drainage would come back to committee, perhaps. Would that give them um, assurance about then, then, you know, parishioners and what have you would have another opportunity to raise concerns on drainage? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Goff, appreciate you're not a drainage engineer, but I don't know if you had a, a view on that. Well, look, look. I I have um, sort of got the the had some wisdom from the um, the other directors of the internal drainage board on this and and you know as Mr Mason said this site is it, it's worthy of just you, you, I know some members have been to the site but not everyone it's just worthy of reflecting a little bit on this site because uh, while Mr Sexton said that the, the gradient is uh, is not great. Uh, this is a hill by Cottenham standards, um, which which run down, runs down to uh, Les King Wood, which is a very, very popular uh, recreational space for the village. So this is an area which is of uh, real, real significance. Um, I think it's fair to say that the internal drainage board uh, is very sensitive to, to to this site and to the runoff, uh, and it, they feel that the discharge of these conditions is an, is an important matter. Um, I I won't I'm not in a position to be able to say whether they view uh, a potential scheme as possible or not, but uh, they certainly would want to be uh, engaged in those uh, in the discharge of those conditions. As, as would the parish. Thank you. Did you want to come back, Councillor Williams? Yeah, I just want to, to clarify. So I think that was a, you would welcome if the discharge condition come back to committee. I just want to clarify that, given its importance. Um, and the other thing was around whether a solution can be found. Because obviously, if a solution can't be found, that no matter how the debate goes today, it can't proceed because they can't discharge the conditions. So... It's, we're not being asked to sort of refuse because a solution can't be found. That's that's what I'm trying to ascertain, what we're being asked to do here. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, perhaps, Councillor Goff, it might be useful to hear from Mr Sexton at this stage regarding the drainage. Michael, if you're there. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you, I suspect Council Williams is, is drawing on um, the recent debate committee about the Tevisham Road 4 Bolton site. Um, the, this Rampton Road site, it, it's in flood zone 1, um, and none of the site is identified as being at risk from surface water um, flooding through the Environment Agency maps, unlike Tevisham Road, which was considered um, previously by the committee that was identified as being essentially completely at risk of surface water flooding. Um, as Mr. Griffiths, as Mr. Griffiths alluded to, um, the, the agent has engaged extensively with the Lee Local Flood Authority in ensuring that the, the, there is a suitable drainage scheme that can be delivered. There's sufficient information with the reserve mass applications to um, demonstrate that a scheme can indeed be delivered. Um, those details are reserved by condition on the outline consent. The surface water condition is is very detailed in terms of what it will require. Um, it's condition 17, but it's, uh, 16, but it has got eight specific points, which does include maintenance and adoption of the drainage system. 
Um, as you can see in the officer reports in uh, paragraphs 21, um, 31, 34 and 38, all of the technical drainage consultees, including the Old West Internal Drainage Boards, are satisfied with the information that has been provided at this stage. Um, and there would be more information to come forward at discharge condition stage, which would be subject to consultation with the technical consultees. Parish Council would be notified that the application had been received by the by the council and they wouldn't be formally consulted, but they'd be notified and would would make comment, could have the opportunity to make current comments irrespective of the lack of a formal consultation. So it's so, so very happy, not happy, satisfied at this stage for reserve matters that there aren't grounds to um, look to refuse or resist this application on um, insufficient information to demonstrate a suitable scheme can be delivered. So um, hopefully that Thank gives you. some that's, that's, that's very helpful, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Dornton, please. Remember, we're still asking questions of clarity of the local it's member. It's for Councillor Goff, the question is Councillor Goff. Yeah. Um, Councillor Goff, can you, can you just remind us what you said in relation to the footpath? Um, I am familiar with the site and I do uh, recognise what you're saying about it's being car dependent if there's no footpath. Were you um, indicating that at the meeting, the meeting that you're having, you're about to have, is to devise a route for a possible footpath? Yes, that's the okay. case. This is outside of the, the red line area of the, of the development. So this falls into um, what I think is uh, good common sense uh, improvements to the development, which is outside of this application. That's uh, that's understood. Um, but, but we do have a meeting. We do have a meeting next week with, uh, as um, Mr. Griffiths has said, with uh, Tilia Holmes, with the county and with the parish to try and craft a solution, which frankly is in the best interest of everyone. Because if you look at those um, the houses on this site, which are at the North End, very close to uh, Les King Wood, uh, a pedestrian route from those houses to the school, uh, which as the crow flies is no, not, not much more than 300 metres, uh, is, a, is a very, very long walk. Uh, and frankly, our expectation is that, that uh, parents would jump in their cars to do that. Whereas if we could provide a cycling and walking infrastructure that would benefit everyone. Uh, as I said in my comments, not not least the uh, the future residents of this development. But that is outside, that is outside of the matters you are considering today. Um, but is also, but, but is reflective of uh, what we hope can be done uh, with goodwill from all the parties to improve this, uh, this application. Okay, thank you, Councillor Goff. And I don't think there's any more questions for yourself. So Thank you for joining us virtually today and addressing the committee. Um, members, those, that concludes the public speakers we have. So we're now gonna move into the debate. So we do also have an opportunity at this stage to ask questions of clarity from the officer. And if, if Michael needs to pull up any of the images or documents uh, that he, he presented to us at the beginning of this item, uh, we can ask him to do that too. Councillor Daunton, please. Um. Yes, um, this is a question for, for the officer. Um, thank you, Mr. Sexton, for a very clear report. Um, and my question concerns the residential space standards. Um, now, I know uh, from your report that this uh, falls outside the reserve matters, but I do just want to ask um, in relation to um, the paragraphs on page 99, um, where you say under um, paragraph 102, uh, that 60 market dwellings failed to provide to comply in terms of the area of built-in storage. And I wondered if there was any scope for trying to provide storage outside the dwellings, because we know how difficult it is for families um, in houses where, it, it, where there are family dwellings and there isn't sufficient storage. So I just wondered if there was any scope for external storage to improve uh, where some of the dwellings are below national space standards. I regret that we can't consider that under that, reserve matters. Is that a question for the officer? Okay, Michael, if you caught that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Dawson. Um, 
Yeah, but paragraph 102 is the policy um, sets out requirements for internal floor space and it breaks it down for the number of bedrooms, the number of occupants, and then one story, two story, three story. It also includes a column specifically for built in storage. Um, so where those 16 market dwellings don't have a dedicated um, storage area shown on the plan, um, they do already exceed the minimum internal floor space. So there is ample storage available, I suppose it's, it's just not illustrated as dedicated storage space. So some of the properties, so for example, the policy requires two square metres of built in storage. Um, those 16 market dwellings exceed the minimum internal floor stand spaces by more than that. So the, the space is there, it's just not shown as dedicated storage. It was just, just want to highlight that slight element to members. So I don't think there is a deficiency in terms of the, there is availability within properties, it's just not shown a dedicated space. That was the slight issue with that policy. If that's any help. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just sort of going going through things, I think it's important and others have recognised that there has been an improvement from, from what we saw before um, and, and that's welcome. I think the, um, the case with the unadopted roads, I think that seems to be more of a, an issue with the process and the system in my mind rather than the application. The fact that, I say, even if you're built to standards, you can't guarantee adoption from, from the other council. So I share other members' frustrations in that, but I do think that's more of a process than this particular application. Um, when it comes to the drainage issues, um, I think I think obviously that's that's the the main thing for myself, um, and trying to look at the order of things and it's sort of chicken and chicken and egg which comes first. And I can understand why people would want to see the drainage um, things at this stage, but again, that's not the process that that we deal with. Um, so I'm I'm wondering if it's possible, given I think it has been very well um, and clearly shown that there are particular drainage issues in this particular area. It's not sort of the run of the mill as I've been described with the gradients and everything else. So given that it's sort of an, an exceptional, uh, exceptional case for drainage here, whether we are able, whether it's in our gift to say that in this instance, because of the exceptional nature that we will consult with the parish council on on the discharge of condition in relation to drainage and that it would come to ourselves um, that way we're not unnecessarily holding things up we they won't the developer won't be able to proceed unless they could demonstrate and discharge that condition um, and i think it is right given the level of concern on that issue that we we try to um, make sure that people get the opportunities that they that they need to to um, be able to partake in that discussion, um, and to be very clear as a committee that unless those conditions are met, then development should should not go ahead. Um, but there has been quite a lot of evidence to show that this might not be the right solution, but that a solution is potentially possible. Um, so that's where I'm at at the moment. And I would say for the for the first time, members would be shocked to hear that I'm actually satisfied with the distribution of affordable housing Good. because that's normally a, a pet issue for myself. I, I you know, wish and um, credit where credit's due, it is dispersed through the site in small clusters. I even know the policy off by heart now, Chair. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm just going to bring Mr Carter in on the drainage issue. Thanks, Chair. Uh, through you. Um, so just to give members comfort, all the drainage conditions are pre-commencement drainage conditions on the outline consent, so nothing can happen until those conditions have been discharged. Um, it's not the council's normal practice to formally consult parish councils on discharge of condition applications given their technical nature. Um, however, parish councils are normally notified um, of those applications being submitted. And as, as I think uh, Mr Sexton said uh, in one of his answers, uh, we would, of course, um, take on board uh, comments received from the parish council. So. I don't think there's a um, requirement, in my view at least, to formally consult them, albeit um, they're clearly heavily involved, the applicants clearly involved with them uh, in ongoing discussions along with Councillor Goff. So I think 
uh, I'm satisfied that uh, the opportunity will be there for the parish council without needing to change our normal process to formally consult them. Uh, but obviously, if the committee decides it wants to instruct officers to do that, then, of course, uh, the committee is free to make that decision. Okay. And I will come back to that at the end before we take a vote, if that's okay. Yeah, if you want to come back. Great. So that was about the consultation. Are we also able to say that we'll see it as committee? Chris? Um, again, obviously, it's not standard practice to bring conditions to committee, given... Um, you know, committee is there to deal with the, the, the sort of more com complex uh, and contentious items, generally speaking, and we want to minimise the workload of the committee. However, uh, again, the committee can uh, make that uh, requirement if it, if it wishes to do so. Um, whether it's necessary in this case, I'd suggest it may not be at the moment. You've got to bear in mind we've got no objection from the Lead Local Flood Authority, no objection from the Internal Drainage Board, uh, and we've got conditions, details for which are still to be submitted. So. It may be that the applicant can come forward with a scheme that is to everyone's satisfaction. And so in those circumstances, you know, does the committee need to, to consider it um, you know, as part of its business? Okay. But I will come back to that question before we take the vote. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Okay. Um, if I may stay on the drainage issue. I know for a fact, because it has happened in my ward, um, that we have had uh, drainage condition brought back to committee. Um, so it's not unusual, um, but I take your point that uh, committee should deal with big issues. However, it's an issue of grave concern um, to the parish, and I have been on a site visit um, to the site um, when we had it before us before, and I can quite appreciate the concern um, of residents. So I will be prepared to support a request that the committee um, requests that the condition comes back to us to be looked at, and of course consulted with the um, with the parish council. Um, no doubt, uh, the development um, talking to the parish council anyway uh, in coming up with the solution. Um, the other point I wanted to. Uh, raise was on the reasons for the refusal that we had before, um, which were upheld um, at appeal. But I'm glad to see that uh, the new site owners have actually um, made changes that have addressed uh, those issues. And if Councillor Goff is happy with the changes that have been made, so am I. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Councillor Fain, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, th there are clearly some uh, matters of concern which have been raised today in relation to the adoption of roads, the primary heating scheme and the need to make ensure there is possibility of upgrading that in the future, the drainage issues and the footpath cycleway connections. However, um, it does seem to me that many of those are not for consideration at this stage, uh, most of them are under discussion anyway. A number of them are already met by conditions. So the question arises, should we seek to impose extra conditions to ask that this, some of these conditions come back to this committee uh, on compliance stage, or indeed consider a deferral of the application? And looking at those, I'm very persuaded by what Councillor Goff said. The reasons for the original refusal have clearly been addressed and met. The concerns of the Parish Council in relation to the neighbourhood plan, it seems to me these developers have gone to great lengths to meet those, particularly in relation to the vista, to the total number of houses and so on. And I think that in this case, we have developers who are clearly prepared to consider uh, matters that we are not in any case a in a position to, to enforce. I am in any case opposed to matters being brought back to this committee unless there is a really a real need for that. I don't think that is the right way or the best way to get the right answer. So taking all of that into account and the assurances that we've heard this morning, I'm inclined to say that the time has now come 
to approve this reserve matters application as it stands. Thank you, Councillor. I don't believe we have any further speakers in the debate members. Um, obviously, we do have a recommendation in front of us to approve this application. We have had a request and then a subsequent uh, indication of support for that request to bring the specific drainage conditions back to this committee for a decision, as well as officially consulting the parish council rather than just informing them that a, uh, a submission has been made. Um, I think we as a committee need to be clear about what we want to do with that before we take the vote on the recommendation. Um, so, uh, Councillor Heather Williams, are you putting a proposal forward in regards to bringing something back here? Uh, yes, but taking on board um, the comments from Mr Carter um, and looking to Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins, she seemed to support what I was saying, whether a, a compromise on that would be to say that if the parish council and local members are in conflict with the recommendation of that. So essentially, if, if all is agreed, if the parish council are happy and the local members happy with what's proposed, then it needn't come back to committee. But if there is any conflict of view on the suitability of the drainage con um, condition, then it will come back to us um, given the exceptional circumstances. And I, I do think there should be a consultation. Um, and happy to okay. s propose those separately if you want, Chair, or put them all in okay. together. Um, I will ask Mr Carter to come in at this stage just to give the officers view. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to say, um, the Parish Council, of course, does have the option to call anything uh, to the delegation meeting anyway, but um, I don't have any um, concern with the suggestion that they're formally consulted and provided they're satisfied it's delegated and if they uh, have outstanding concerns, then officers would bring it back to committee. Th these are for the drainage conditions only, though. Yes, Yes, it, it's just in relation to drainage and I'd say parish council or local member. Okay, so um, other members of the committee, are we generally in agreement with that? that procedure or does anyone have any issue with that okay we have a proposal for that and a seconder members are we all in agreement that this is the way we should move forward does anyone not think that's what we should be doing no okay so we will incorporate that into the recommendation then that the parish are officially consulted and if there are any concerns then it will be brought back to the committee is that correct yeah okay councillor daunton could I just be clear then, it's the parish and the local members? I think the local member gets a right to comment on any application okay. anyway, okay. but the parish Thanks. will be an official consultee rather than just being told that this was what's happening. Um, okay, members, well, with that addition and uh, that change of procedure, we have a recommendation on page 121. Um, and that is that we approve the application subject to the conditions plus the addition that we've just made. Uh, members, I haven't heard any dissent to this, so with those changes, can I take by affirmation that this is approved? Does anybody not think that? Does anybody wish to abstain? No, so that application is approved. Thank you very much, everyone that uh, contributed to that debate. Members, we'll move on now to item number seven, which is an application in North Stowe. Someone can help me with a page number, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Page 127. I've had a request from the legal officer for a five minute break. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of seeing nods around the room. So it's now five to 12. So I'll actually say we'll have a quick 10 minute break, actually. Uh, so if we're back in our seats ready to start at five past 12, uh, that would be great. Thank you very much, everybody.
Thank you very much, members. We're now restarting the meeting and we are up to agenda item number seven, which is an application in North Stowe, south of Longstanton Road, North Stowe. And the proposal is a variation of a condition on an already approved reserve matters application. Um, the applicant is Urban Splash House Limited, and the application is before us today because Longstanton Parish Council has requested that the application be decided by committee, and also because it's a major development in receipt of objections and a complex application, in the opinion of officers, in consultation with the chairman and vice chairman. Bit of a mouthful there. The presenting officer is Ms. Kate Poyser. Kate, are you with us online? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. So, yeah, if you could let us know of any updates to the report we have in front of us, and then if you'd like to introduce that report. Right. Uh, thank you. There are no further updates uh, to the report. I should just prepare the presentation. If you bear with me a moment, please. Right, uh, thank you. Now, uh, this plan shows phase 2A of Norstow Newtown within its context. Could you, Chair, just confirm to me that you can see this slide? We can. Thank you. Uh, the buildings are shown in grey. Uh, this represents the phase 2A site. And if I just zoom in a little bit here, uh, this area here is the age restricted accommodation uh, to which this application uh, refers specifically. Uh, to the rest of the site um, are the existing homes of Rampton Drift. To the south is the proposed town centre and to the east is the education site. Uh, directly to the north lies the Greenway. This is a green swathe within which the principal footpaths, cycleways, drainage swales and tree planting take place. Much of this has already been provided on site. To the northeast of this part of phase 2A uh, is an area called the Peninsula, which is largely built. Now, um, this slide, I'm just going to run through a few photographs of, of the site. This slide shows the, it was taken from the age restricted building site and it looks towards the peninsula. As you can see, the buildings are three storeys high and they are almost complete. The white buildings have yet to receive their external cladding. Uh, this photo shows the age restricted site as viewed from the north and it's just a muddy field at the moment. To the left are the peninsula houses. The construction taking place here relates to the Greenway. Uh, this is part of the Greenway that extends to the north of the peninsula site and we are looking at the footpath and the cycleway. This part of uh, this is the Greenway, which is directly opposite and is to the north of the age restricted site. As you can see, there is some tree planting that has taken place. Uh, the swale is behind here and the footpath is currently under construction. Just moving on to the site and ground floor plans. Um, the one to the left shows the age restricted scheme that has already got planning permission. And to the right is the amended scheme under consideration today. Um, just to point out a few matters. Um, the proposed amendments relate to the design of the building and the auxiliary ancillary space. 
The number and size of the apartments proposed remains at 60, 45 with one bedroom and 15 with two bedrooms. The main purpose of the amendments is to provide better living conditions for the future occupiers. The proposed building has car parking contained within the envelope. So this area here is actually within the envelope of the building. So the first floor lies directly above. The proposed scheme takes the parking out of the building envelope and provides a greater proportion of apartments at ground floor level. Surface car parking is provided adjacent to the building here. In the proposed scheme, some of the apartments would have small private gardens, this area here. Uh, a walled garden is also proposed next to the cycle store down here. The southern end of the building would be lower in height uh, to enable more sunlight into the internal courtyards and gardens. This would only be two storeys high, whereas over here we're looking at uh, four storeys high. Uh, with regard to the surface water drainage, the car parking spaces are proposed to be permeable. A swale is proposed. Uh, similar to the approved scheme, only moves slightly towards the west. Here are the approved and proposed ground floor plans, which better illustrate the shape of the building as approved and as proposed. You can also see the proportion of the ground floor apartments in each area, in each. The whole of the approved building is four storeys high with the exception of the southernmost section which is actually five stories high for the proposed building the red lined area uh, would be two stories high the purple three stories the yellow four stories high and the five uh, the, the green would be five stories i'm just moving on to the uh, uh, the elevations uh, for comparison here are the east and north elevations of the approved and proposed buildings. The east elevation is the top one and that's the one that would front on to the principal access road. Uh, for anyone who received a uh, plans pack, um, you, you may find that the east and west elevations are incorrectly labelled. Uh, here you can see the reduced bulk of the southern end of the building and for the north elevation, you can see that the building would have less impact on the dwellings to the west. The dwellings to the west are just over here. And this is the final slide and it shows the south and west elevations for comparison. Um, overall, it is considered that the amended scheme would be an improved design and that it can be treated as an amendment under Section 73 and the recommendation is that permission should be granted. Hello. Good afternoon to you. Yes, correct. Initiatives, there may be questions of clarity from the committee for yourself. So, whenever you're ready, please. For the opportunity today to speak in support of the application. My name is Anthony Child. I'm a planning associate from Bidwells, speaking on behalf of the applicant housed by Urban Splash. Urban Splash are the development partner of Homes England, delivering the first residential parcel within phase two, known as phase 2A. 
The reserved matters consent for this parcel was approved by this committee in February 2020. Overall, phase 2A will deliver 406 dwellings, including 60% affordable homes in a quality environment that, that achieves high levels of sustainability through employing modern methods of construction. The first modular homes are now being delivered on site. An important element of Urban Splash's master plan is the age restricted affordable rent accommodation, which is the subject of this section 73 application before you today. The amendments relate solely to this building and the immediate landscaping. The remainder of the master plan is as per the existing reserved matters consent. The world has changed significantly over the last 18 months or so, particularly in relation to how people are using their homes and their access and connection to open spaces. This alongside refinements during the pr progression of the detailed design has given Urban Splash the opportunity to reflect and consider how they can design and deliver an improved environment for the age restricted accommodation to the benefit of its occupants. The design changes are the result of extensive and detailed pre-application discussions with planning, urban design, landscape and housing officers. The feedback received has directly informed and shaped the amended proposal before you today. Some of the improvements include improving the amenity of the central courtyard by reconfiguring the layout and reducing the heights of the eastern and southern blocks to allow more sunlight throughout the day. The introduction of three communal terraces, introduction of a ward garden community space, addition of private amenity spaces to some ground floor apartments, and the introduction of communal meeting rooms which create an active frontage and views through to the central courtyard. The improvements have resulted in a proposal which is recommended for approval and in the view of officers delivers an improved scheme, both in terms of its function and appearance. Importantly, the accommodation still delivers 60 affordable rented apartments with a mix unchanged from the approved scheme. All of the apartments meet the lifetime home standard as required by the outline consent. The building does not exceed the height of that already assessed and approved and changes to the layout and appearance comply with the outline consent and design code. Overall, the amended proposal presents a high quality, sustainable landscape led development. A resolution to grant today will support House in delivering an improved offering for the age restricted accommodation and much needed affordable market housing as part of the wider master plan for phase 2A. Thank you. Tea for Mr. Child. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, Mr. Child, just to be clear, your reason for bringing forward this revised uh, plan is what exactly, again? Why? To, Im to improve the environment for the occupants. Okay, so you so are... Th Go sorry. On. Oh no, so as, as the detailed design was progressing um, and Urban Splash were reflecting <laughs> on events, uh they wanted to see if we could reconfigure the building to improve the open spaces improve ground floor apartments okay thank you thank you members anything further for mr child no no thank you very much mr child um thank you we will now move on to our last public speaker which is uh, Councillor Paul Littlemore, who I believe is from North Stowe Town Council. Councillor Littlemore, are you with us? Yes. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'll I'll get straight into it. So, uh, North Stowe Town Council. Just for clarity, before you do kick off, can I just uh, appreciate your enthusiasm, but uh, <laughs> can I just double check that you do have the permission of North Stowe Town Council to represent their views today? I do. OK, thank you. And as per all the other speakers, you have three minutes to address the committee. And if you wouldn't mind holding on at the end in case there are questions for yourself. So w whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. So North State Town Council, as reflected in our written comments, are supportive of the design change proposed in the age restricted housing block. Uh, and we note the officer's report's consideration of the environmental impact, concern, uh, impact assessment concerns that were raised as part of our written comments. However, concerns continue uh, continue to be raised by North Stowe Town Council about the potential social isolation until retail facilities are delivered closer to the site or appropriate public transportation options exist, given the low ratio of parking spaces to dwellings. 
The town council seeks to clarify that the officer's report details that the site will be well connected by footpaths to nearby bus stops, though to our knowledge there are no imminent plans to operate any bus service through North Stowe at the present time. With the town centre construction still years away, we would like relevant parties, the developer, South Cambridgeshire District Council, Cambridgeshire County Council, to ensure that appropriate access to public transport facilities, even if on a temporary basis, are given serious consideration. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Councillor Littlemore? No, no, I think that was very, very coherent, Councillor. So thank you very much for addressing the committee today. Thank you. Okay, members, with that, we move into the, the debate now. So, as usual, we do have, obviously, this is the opportunity to ask the case officer if there's anything that needs clarifying for us. Um, so, yep, yeah, so I will open the debate now. Starting off with Councillor Ripith, I think I saw you in my periphery. Thank you. Um, this is kind of for debate but also I know it's not directly relevant because this is already one version is already approved and we're looking at the environment and the change slight change in design however if any of the officers present know um, it is really important the sort of public transport connection especially for elderly people who may not have a car and we're trying to also um, you know move away from car ownership. Um, have we any information on when the busway is going to be delivered in North Stow so that the timing perhaps links in, connects in better with the building of these homes than it has done otherwise? Okay. Uh, Kate, I don't know if you know the answer to that, do you, when the busway is likely to be delivered? Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I, I don't have any accurate information on that. I don't know whether my colleague, uh, Mr Carter, is able to help at all on that one. I think actually he almost presented himself to us. I think Tam Parry is with us from the County Council. Tam? Hi, good afternoon, committee. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear and see you. So I don't know if you can oh, clarify the issue around the busway delivery date. I do my best. It, it, it's something that's not known at the moment. It needs the urban splash development to be completed and for several other parcels of development along the, the route of the busway to be completed before it can open for buses to be to, to use it all of the time. What we don't want to do is is open it and then have to close it because of construction works and then have to open it again and close it. So it's it's difficult to, to ascertain exactly when all of these developments will be completed on the route of the busway. I think the more likely time when we'll get buses into this area is when the first part of the town centre comes forward in around about 2024. Um, and I'm hoping that with Homes England's help, we can get a bus service to come into the top part of the town centre um, to service development also. So we are several years away from a local bus service coming into this area, I'm afraid, but it's, it's just part and parcel of the difficulties of, of, of getting buses into the area so that they can turn around and, and, and then exit. Uh, sorry. The that, that's correct, yes. Very much so, yes. With Homes England, ourselves, um, then with the combined authority at the appropriate time, um, and we're looking at, at whatever we can do to, to get the local bus service into the area. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, 
I think this, this is a question for Kate. Uh, the, one of the concerns of the Nostal Town Council was on, you know, it's bullet point five, talking about an area of green having been removed. Um, and so what is the impact on surface water drainage? I might have missed it, but I did have a look, but I couldn't see that that was addressed in the report. Uh, Kate, can you clarify that, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I wonder if I could just share my screen again. Um, that might help me to answer. Right. Um, hopefully you can now see the site and ground floor plans. Um, right. Now, this is the approved scheme. If you can see the cursor over here, I just turn on the laser point. Right, this is the approved scheme over this side. Um, this is the green space through which the um, parish council, town council refers. Um, that will be reduced, as you can see on this side. But the, the swale running north south is the same. It's just moved over slightly. So a small amount of green space would be lost, and but there would be permeable paving for the parking spaces here. And perhaps more importantly, for the houses that are proposed along here, if I go to the approved scheme, now this car park, um, if, if you recall earlier in my presentation, this uh, it's built over and it would be four stories high. So it's a very narrow corridor here, a very narrow corridor. Um, but the proposed scheme, there's no building over the multi, the, over the parking area. So the building is actually a much further away. So you would then have much wider space here. And the, the building here is only going to be two stories high. So there would be a much greater sense of space. Thank you. Yes, but I think the issue was on whether or not that reduced greenery was part of the drainage and would affect the surface water draining away. OK, if if I can just share the, the drawing again. Now, the strategic um, I'm getting a lot of echo here, it's quite difficult to hear. Uh, the strategic drainage scheme lies in the greenway, which runs along here, or along here, and there's a swale which runs, it's just off the picture here. It, the swale would uh, run along here, well, it's already existing. Now, the proposal okay, is to pipe, high. if I go over to the proposed scheme, it, the proposal is to pipe any surface water from this swale across to the uh, the main swale strategic drainage, uh, part of the strategic drainage scheme to the swale over here. So there is no actual change proposed to the greenway or the strategic drainage scheme. Um, on a drainage point of view, there, there would be very little change. Um, I don't know if that answers your, your question. I Thank you, Kate. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. And what I'm about to say makes me wonder if actually we're meant to have declared an interest, obviously, that we've seen this application before, but looking at it afresh today, because um, I'm going to reflect back on, on what I said at the previous meeting. Um, so I, I didn't support this previously because I had great concerns about the heights of the buildings um, that were being proposed. So I do see that what's come forward with the lower heights as a as a you know slight positive um, to address that concern, I think we've got the fallback position of what's currently there anyway. Um, so, if I was looking at this as an entirely new thing, I probably still would vote against because I'm still not happy with some of the top heights. I, I think it's too high, considering its proximity to Rampton Drift and the assurances that were given to them, but. As we have that fallback position in place, it is a slight improvement on that. 
so would be um, inclined to, to support the application on that sort of caveat basis. Sure. Thank you for that. Councillor Daunton, please. Yes, thank you. I, I do want to come back to the issue of transport. Um, do I understand that there will be no public transport here until the busway is, uh, is there, is, is in place? There's no other public transport, is that correct? Uh, I think Chris is going to dive in. Thank you, Chair. So there is public transport available at North so, but it's obviously some distance from this specific parcel of land at the moment. You've got the, uh, the guided busway, which obviously runs around the periphery of the new town at the moment, uh, with the, the stop just by the park and ride uh, to the north side of North Stowe. So that's what's there at the moment. So there is public transport available, um, but it's not running through the site at this stage for the reasons that Tam, Tam Parry explained. OK, so um, could I just come back on that, Chair? Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the, there would be no opportunity to provide an interim solution to that, because if we're talking about age-restricted accommodation, as Councillor Ripper said, that we might ha well have people there without a car and perhaps not easily able to cycle. Um, I, I can't really work out the distance myself, but I just wonder if there's an opportunity to provide um, an interim solution for public transport. To you, Chair. I think, um, having regard to what Tam um, had to say, that, that's being explored at the moment, but I, my advice would be it's not something to uh, seek to control through this application, which is a Section 73 of a Reserve Matters application. So those conversations are already taking place between the County Council, ourselves, and, and Homes England, uh, with a view to looking to, to achieve that. But um, it, it's a separate conversation to the consideration of this application, notwithstanding the point made. Thank, Thank you. you. Sort of Richard Williams, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll be brief because a lot of the points I wanted to make have already been covered. Um, I don't like this application. I don't like the fact that there's no public transport. And I think if there's no public transport at the start, you're not going to, you know, achieve really the benefits we want because people will be um, car dependent when they, they first move in. I don't like the design of it. <laughs> I think it's far too uh, dense and I don't like the building heights. Um, but given the existing application, I'm struggling to, I would struggle to formulate a reason to refuse it, although I may still abstain. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Peter Payne. I wonder if I could ask Kate Poyser to bring up the elevations that I think she showed us earlier on, if that's possible. Kate, if you'd mind. Yes, yes, certainly. Just share. We are definitely doing fine. Uh, Chair, that shows the comparison between the approved and the proposed elevations. I'm conscious of the fact that one of the changes made to the NPPF this year in, Ju in July was that beauty is now a specific planning consideration, even though it isn't designed, isn't uh, specified. And of course, that may be a fact to be taken out in taken into account in. Uh, design guides and so on. The approved plans include some uh, pitched roofs, um, I think if I recall some balconies and so on, whereas the proposed plans are entirely flat roofed. It's very difficult to say which is, uh, if you like, better in terms of beauty. It's a subjective matter inevitably. But I wonder to what extent this is a factor to be taken into account in considering the proposed amendment. Not sure if an officer wants to come back on that. Okay, I'm happy to comment on that. I mean, clearly the design changes are one of the key considerations in this application, so it's perfectly open to members to consider whether or not they're satisfied with the, uh, with the alternative design or not, uh, and to, to vote accordingly. But it, it's certainly a material consideration for this matter. Thank okay. you. Mr. Ripeth, please. Thank you for indulging me a second time. Um, something I kind of am really pleased about is that it looks like the developer has looked at how the development is going so far and has come back to it and thought we could put in some um, improvements. One thing which I do particularly like about it is the um, fact there will be more light 
which is um, crucial, I think, in anybody's home. And I um, feel on that, that's a really major factor, actually, in how I'm um, thinking about voting on this, that it is an improvement from the previous design. And um, I will be voting for it. Great. Thank you very much. Councillor Timmy Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair. Perhaps um, a question for Kate. Did this change in design actually go through our design enabling panel or not? Uh, yes, it, well, it, it didn't go through the design panel, but it, it was um, negotiations with our urban designers did take place. So they were very much involved at an early phase uh, through pre-application advice in um, giving advice on how to design this and they felt that they their advice had been taken into account strangely enough i think i prefer the previous design though not the heights um they do say beauty is in the eye of the beholder however the for me the positive in this revision is the sense of better placemaking and amenity for the future occupants um, of this flat. Um, and that perhaps for me is what tips the balance rather than the design, but I think I will be supporting it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And Councillor Khan, please. Um, to repeat points made by previous uh, uh, comments, um, I cannot say that I like the new design as a design uh, more than the previous one. I don't, but I do take very much the point about light. Having a uh, large four-story building uh, uh, to the south of the site will make a big impact on the solar, uh, the sunshine coming in, and that has great impact on how you feel when you're in a dwelling. So I do see that as an improvement, um, and I tend to agree with Councillor Hawkins that I think this outweighs any concerns about the beauty or otherwise of the designs, which are not, neither of us are great wonders of, of architectural design, uh, appear a beauty in any case. So um, I don't think that's a sufficient reason to refuse it. Okay. So I should be supporting the application. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I don't have any further speakers, members, um, so I think we're probably ready to, to make a decision on this. Um, I am going to take a vote on it because I haven't heard from everyone the clear affirmation. So I'd like Aaron, if you could set up the voting system, please. Members, the recommendation is on page 143 of our agendas, uh, and that's that we approve the changes as outlined. Um, and also, we give delegated authority to officers to carry out minor wording changes subject to approval with the chair and vice chair. So that, that is what we are. Okay, so we're going old school. We're go <laughs> it's going to have to be a raise of hands, please, members. So given the recommendation I've just explained, can I have a show of hands, please, for those in favour of that? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight in favour. Those against? Zero. And abstentions? One. So that application is approved. Thank you very much. So we're moving on to agenda item eight, which is on page 163 of our agendas. This is again in the North Stowe Parish. It's land west of Station Road, or sorry, Long Stanton slash North Stowe. It's land west of Station Road, Long Stanton. Uh, the proposal is an outline planning permission for up to 107 dwellings. The applicant is Endurance Estates Limited. The recommendation is to grant approval subject to the completion of a 106 agreement. There are a raft of material considerations in our agendas. And the reason it's coming to us today because it is a complex application and the fact that Longstow Parish Council is a joint landowner. Um, what did I say? Longstanton. Longstanton. Sure. <laughs> Longstow can breathe a sigh of relief there. <laughs> Longstanton Parish Council is a joint landowner. And also a third reason, it's wider relationship with North Stowe development as a whole. The presenting officer is already on our screens, Guy Wilson. Welcome, Guy. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Afternoon. So if you'd like to give us any updates to the report and then introduce that report for committee members, please. 
thank you, Chair. So uh, I'll just share my screen quickly. Uh, if you can confirm, you can see that okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, so in terms of updates, uh, the, the only update is uh, I'll just be expanding on the uh, summary heads of terms um, included in, in the report just to kind of clarify how those figures have been derived and I'll come on to that at the end of my, my presentation. Um, so as you said, the application is for up to 107 dwellings, um, a flexible um, employment uh, community at sort of cafe use um, and other associated development. Uh, so this shows the site location plan. Uh, you can see it's to the west of Station Road, um, close to the guided busway um, at the northern end of, of Northstow. Um, there is a single dwelling within the site um, and <coughs> excuse me, and a number of associated buildings, um, a dwelling immediately to the south. Um, there's a industrial uh, development to the, to the south as well. Uh, the park and ride is to the east. Uh, and there is a employment site uh, known as Digital Park to the north of the site. Um, and this is an aerial view of the site showing its sort of current conditions. Here you can see the uh, existing dwelling um, on, the, on the southern part of the site. Um, there's a, a hedgerow of uh, Lilanda trees um, in the towards the southern end of the site, uh, which I'll, uh, I'll kind of uh, uses a sort of marker in some site photos coming up um, you can see there's existing hedging along the northern boundaries uh, so the site frontage to station road um, and also vegetation within the site uh, so this is a site photo looking into the site uh, from station road uh, you can see existing hedgerows uh, on the northern boundary uh, and also vegetation within the site and then the so those land lay on the trees um, uh, on, the, on the left of the screen uh, this is a photo of the existing junction um, you can see it's a signalized junction um, so this this view is looking south towards north Stow, um, with the uh, the eastern arm to the park and ride on the left of the photo and then the site frontage on the right hand side here you can see currently there is no uh, pedestrian footpath on the uh, the western side of station road um, and there is currently a shared pedestrian cycle route along the eastern side of, of station road uh, this is another view of the site from the southwest uh, so this is from the uh, the b1050 sort of uh, long Stanton bypass uh, you can see the low land light um, hedges um, uh, sort of shown earlier um, and the extent of the site and then uh, on the right hand side of the screen you can see uh, sort of development within uh, phase one of North Stowe. Um, it's worth noting obviously this land in the foreground, foreground is um, included within the site area of the uh, North Stowe phase 3b um, application. Uh, which is currently pending. Uh, this is a, another site photo of the site just from the busway from the, the northwest. Um, you can see again the, the land eye hedges um, and then sort of vegetation along the boundaries of the site uh, and the development at Digital Park to the north of the site. And again, the fields um, in the foreground, which uh, within the site area of, of North Stoke Phase uh, 3B. Uh, it's moving on to the context uh, with uh, the wider North Stowe development. So this is the so master plan for uh, for North Stowe phase one with residential areas shown in yellow. Uh, we've got the primary school in orange, the mixed use local centre in red with the sort of uh, town square area in light green and then an employment site, uh, employment area in uh, this sort of dark blue colour and just the, the park and ride just uh, to the north here um, and so it shows the, the site in relation to uh, to, to phase one um, and this, uh, this this diagram shows the site 
in relationship with uh, the North South Phase 3 B proposals. So this, this diagram is taken from the uh, coordination statement produced um, in, co in coordination with Homes England um, as the, the developer of Phase 3 B um, and also the developers of the uh, of digital park to the north. Um, this shows some of the how the sites have been uh, looked at in a later fashion with um, green cor a green corridor through the northern part of the of the site you can see here, which I'll come on to in more detail uh, later. Um, and it shows the sort of the key vehicular routes through the phase three B site um, with a potential connection into uh, the current application site, um, and it also shows. The, uh, the proposed primary school with the large star here, and uh, and and uh, areas of sports and, and play on the western side of, of the of the proposed phase three uh, B development, um, uh, and you can also see uh, here how uh, sort of the the urban structure is kind of proposed to to be developed with uh, sort of market buildings along along the perimeter. Of buildings up to sort of four stories um, anticipated, as well as uh, buildings up to four stories um, close to the western side of, of the current application site. Um, so moving on to site constraints. Uh, so the uh, areas of light green shown here and here are areas of, of potentially contaminated land. Uh, the blue lines either side of Station Road um, are showing existing uh, awarded watercourse, um, and then uh, the blue hatching, light blue hatching. So apologies, it's, it's probably quite faint in one of your images. Uh, shows areas at risk of surface water flooding, uh, with much most of the site either low or, or very low risk of of surface water flooding, and some areas um, at sort of medium risk. See here and here. Um, Note the the light green and orange um, shading is part of the base map and doesn't doesn't indicate any site constraints. Um, moving on to the existing topography and sort of drainage of the site. Uh, so this blue line here shows the uh, awarded watercourse um, which flows uh, north along Station Road, and these uh, dotted blue lines show existing drainage channels within the site which currently flow into that watercourse. Uh, the green arrows show the direction of falls within the site with the uh, the lowest parts of the site being approximately uh, 7.16 metres AOD in the, the northeast and the highest parts of the site being in the, the southwest um, going up to about 8.4 metres AOD. Uh, so this is the proposed site access plan. Um, apologies that the text probably isn't very clear on this. Um, uh, this so this uh, this is shown uh, with sort of east at the top of the the screen, um, with the uh, arm to the park and ride here. Um, so a number of works proposed, which I'll just quickly talk you through. So along the western side of Station Road, um, a 3.5 meter wide shared pedestrian cycle link is proposed, which would um, continue the existing um, shared link along along Station Road, and um, that's proposed along the, the full frontage of the site. Um, a new vehicular access um, is proposed into the site uh, opposite the arm um, uh, towards the park and ride, and this will include a, a, a pedestrian crossing point. Um, some minor changes are also proposed to uh, the uh, the existing uh, junction, um, as well as the provision of a, a controlled pedestrian crossing on the northern arm of the junction. Um, the existing access to the dwelling is proposed to be uh, closed, and the uh, existing field access to, um, uh, uh, sort of northern end of the site is proposed to be uh, to be uh, re re reconstructed into a, uh, a limited sort of service access, um, providing access to a sort of pumping station and, and servicing of the non-residential element of the scheme. Uh, so moving on to uh, land, land use uh, parameter, parameter plan. Um, so 
this shows the proposed developer areas um, in sort of beige colour and uh, and green green space and landscaping in, in green. Um, so this sort of hatched area on the northern area of the site is proposed to be sort of a mixed use uh, wildlife area for um, which includes sort of habitat for for newts and reptiles, uh, which currently within the site, um, and it will also be, serve as a include a uh, an attenu attenuation basis um, as part of the surface water drainage scheme. Um, this diagram also shows also shows existing vegetation to be retained, including uh, sort of key hedgerows along the northern boundary um, uh, and and sort of southern boundary here. Um, it also indicates that a, uh, a sort of strong frontage along Station Road is intended to be provided with uh, this sort of marker building, which would include the uh, the non-residential use um, uh, here. And then this sort of uh, purple star is the proposed in, um, indicated indicative location of the uh, local locally equipped area of play. Moving on to the access and movement parameter plan, so this shows the proposed vehicular route through the site, um, and this could this is an, uh, anticipated to connect into the proposed development uh, north to say phase three B, um, and this could be provided potentially as a as a as a through route or um, as a controlled access um, for, for example um, emergency access only. Uh, dependent on on the on the details uh, sort of agreed through the uh, uh, phase three de development. Um, this also shows uh, the pedestrian and cycle link, which is proposed through the site, um, connecting to the proposed uh, sort of green corridor in phase three B, um, as well as connections in, uh, to the north and south as well, um, which would be yeah pedestrian and, and cycle only. Uh, this plan shows the proposed building heights. Um, so you've got the, the highest parts of the site is up to four storeys um, on the station road frontage. Um, so this would be this sort of marker building, um, uh, including the which would in, yeah, include the uh, the non residential use um, developments up to three storeys shown in in orange on again on the station road frontage, and then uh, sort of this uh, this sort of uh, and also to provide sort of structure through the development um, along the western boundary and then the central site, and then develop up to two and a half stories shown in, in yellow on other parts of the site. Uh, and bring it all together, this is the proposed illustrative site plan. So this isn't proposed to be included as a as an approved document, but illustrates how the how the site could be developed. So you've got the, the access and vehicular route into the site, uh, the pedestrian cycle uh, corridor, green corridor along the northern side of the site, the wildlife area and attenuation basin, uh, the sort of market building, which would include the uh, non-residential use um, and the uh, pedestrian cycle uh, route along Station Road as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'll just provide a bit more detail on the proposed section 106 um, contributions. Um, so I've included in my reports a, a table which shows the what the code contributions would be based on um, uh, uh, the indicative mix um, proposed at this at this time. Um, and this this just provides a bit more detail on, on those contributions um, and shows how they'll be calculated. So um, for example, uh, for the uh, education contributions, uh, these are calculated on the basis of dwelling size and tenure um, uh, on the basis of uh, the, the county council's uh, request. Um, other, other and uh, yeah, the rest of the contributions are shown on this table. So uh, most of these are on the basis of a, a figure per dwelling or a, or a lump sum basis. Um, and of course, these uh, the section one such contributions will be subject to to indexation as well, um, which is anticipated to be from uh, uh, on a res re uh, point of resolution if members are minded to to grant approval. 
uh, and so the key material considerations are set out in the report uh, and the application is recommended for approval subject to completion of a section 106 agreement for the heads of terms um, showed just just now uh, and the conditions informative informatives um, included in uh, appendix one everything guy uh yeah that's everything for the chair great well thank you very much very detailed presentation of the report there um if you don't mind holding on the line we're going to take our public speaker next and then i'm sure members may have some questions for you um and we may possibly need your presentation again to to answer those questions so if you don't mind staying on the line that'd be great okay so we're going to our public speakers next and we have one which is the applicant mr Peter McCown, Peter, I'm sure you're familiar with the process. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Good afternoon, members. Um, I act on behalf of Endurance Estates in respect to this planning application, and I am joined by Mr. Jake Nugent from Endurance. That's great. Thank you. Well, um, as I'm sure you've heard other speakers, it's the same rules for everyone, three minutes to address the committee. And if you don't mind staying there in case there's any questions from the committee of clarification for yourselves. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Whenever you're ready. The site is located within the North Stow Master Plan area, and therefore the principle of development has already been founded. The illustrative master plan and parameter plans demonstrate how a high quality residential development can be brought forward, delivering on the wider master plan objectives through, for example, the incorporation of pedestrian and cycle links significant areas of publicly accessible open space and a wildlife area. The submission of the application followed a detailed pre-application process with officers, which included invaluable input from the Cambridgeshire Quality Panel. We've worked positively with officers throughout and the application is supported by consultees. Engagement has taken place with the local community, North Stowe Town Council and Long Stanton Parish Council. These have influenced the proposals. Key to the proposals is the development coordination statement and guiding principles document that has been prepared in concert with the two adjoining landowners, Homes England and Middle Reach Limited. This document will ensure that a coordinated and consistent development of the land west of Station Road will come forward. The integration and movement framework plan demonstrates how vehicular, pedestrian and cycle connections, not only with adjoining land, will take place, but also with the wider sustainable North Stowe Town Centre. These connections are included within the access and movement parameter plan to give certainty and delivery. The development will also deliver upgrades to the station road junction with the guided busway, including high quality and safe pedestrian crossings. The proposals will address station road in a positive manner and connect with existing footpath networks, ensuring that a permeable development will be introduced. A flexible employment and community space will be introduced on the site frontage and is a sustainable location for this type of use, given proximity to the guided bus and future employment land. The proposals will deliver 40% affordable housing, which should be welcomed and will help to address a local and district wide shortfall. The sustainability credentials of the development are outlined within the sustainability and energy statements that accompanied the application. Importantly, future homes will achieve in excess of the 10% policy requirement for reduction in carbon emissions compared to building regs part L, and on-plot infrastructure will be provided for EV charging. Water efficiency measures will also be introduced and water butts installed in gardens. In summary, a high quality development will be introduced and one that will contribute positively to the creation of a new town and community at North Stowe. There are not considered to be any constraints that would preclude delivery of the proposed development and we would therefore respectfully request that members concur with the officer recommendation and support this planning application many thanks for your time thank you very much for that members questions of clarity please councillor heather williams please thank you chair um through yourself, it was mentioned that um, engagement with North Stow and Long Stanton Parish Councils had led to some positive changes being made. Could we have an example of, of these, please? Please, Peter. 
Yeah, sure. Um, in response to that, Councillor Williams, from the outset, with regards to engagement, we, I suppose to summarise the process, we did engage um, with the parish we presented to the Town Council and some of the issues that were sort of raised during that process were, were drainage and access, really. So we, we really had to look at our proposed drainage strategy with regards to where the surface water drainage will discharge. So that is being discharged to the drainage ditch on Station Road, and that will then discharge the River Ouse to the north. So as part of the process, that was something really, as I sort of said, those drainage requirements were sort of influenced by feedback we received locally from, from residents. One of the other points was just on access, how our new vehicular access will work on the Station Road, and then also the requirements and the view given locally that they wanted sort of safe and direct connections provided with them um, with the guided bus stop. So that is why we are introducing a new controlled sort of junction on Station Road. It also incorporates a three and a half metre wide pedestrian cycle connection as well. So those are really two of the, the key sort of things which have come out of our local consultation. Yes, thank you. Councillor Dawson, please. Thank you. Um, yes, could you just clarify the, the four-storey building at the entrance to the site? Is that necessary in order to ensure that you have the number of dwellings? Yeah, the, the delivery of that four-storey building, Councillor, that came out of really sort of discussions that we've had with your own urban design officers, but then with the Cambridgeshire Quality Panel, and they really felt that it would be important that the, the development, the access in particular, it does provide a presence on the Station Road. And given the proximity of the site, Station Road, by the access to the guided bus, there'll be a lot of activity in that location. And they felt that development on that corner um, can be sort of justified at up to four storeys there. You've also got on the ground floor at that location is where the proposed commercial our community spaces to be located as well. So there will be quite a bit happening there and the view taken was that an, a slight increase in, in sort of scale and massing can be supported. So just to be clear then, you're saying that that is a design decision rather than a decision um, related to numbers of dwellings on the site? Yes, so it, that, yeah, that, that four storey block in the corner, that it is proposed that there will be flats delivered within that block over those three upper floors above the commercial space. Okay, thank you. Any further questions of clarity for the agents? Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair, and through you. I was just having a look at the um, comments made by the quality panel. And um, I mean, comments like, I mean, this presumably is based on the uh, indicative master plan that was taken, that we have seen. And it talks about the development needs to develop a stronger sense of character. I was concerned by the prominent position of the utilities compound. I'm not sure we, the utilities compound was pointed out, but I don't know where that is. And... Um, uh, landscape scheme was weak. I mean, have, have you, I guess this is an outline, so all I'm saying is, at this point in time, it seems to me there's a lot that needs to be done to make whatever comes forward acceptable. <laughs> yeah, can I, can I just come Please. back on that, Councillor yeah. Hawkins? Yeah, so the discussions with the quality panel took very much, they happened at, at the outset, so during the pre-application stage, as I said, and following the meeting we had with the quality panel, the parameter plans and the illustrative master plan has changed significantly. So the, the compound, that has been relocated. And then we've also, one of the key things as you talked about sort of context character, the key sort of themes that came out of the quality panel was that they wanted to see a lot more of the existing green infrastructure on-site retained. So if you look 
at the Google sort of street view, there is a present running sort of north to south within the middle of the site. There's an existing quite significant area of hedging and, and trees. So that area has actually been incorporated into the proposals and is to be retained now on site. And again, just talking back, which is sort of similar to, to my previous sort of point, which Councillor Williams asked, connectivity was another key factor, which was, was raised by the panel and, and really emphasising and defining those links with Station Road and the guided bus. So that again, there, there is a key route which runs across the middle of the site as well that incorporates the three and a half metre wide pedestrian and, and cycle route. Okay, so that will then be in response to the panel's statement about the scheme being weak in terms of movement. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So as it said, those comments from the panel have really influenced the scheme and I think the view which was sort of accepted by the officer um, that the scheme really has um, positively responded to those comments that were received. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, I don't think there's any further questions for the agent applicants. So again, thank you very much for the time and taking the time to come here today. Um, Members, that, those are all the public speakers we have, so we'll be moving into the debate now. Um, and as usual, this is another opportunity to ask the case officer any questions of clarity, and I don't think it's beyond us to be able to pull the presentation up again if that's needed. Uh, I believe Councillor Fain, actually, you're first. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it was just a question of clarification for the case officer. Um, okay, you showed us some... Uh, parameter plans at an earlier stage, which were referred to by Mr. McCown, particularly in relation to access and circulation within the site. I just wanted to clarify the status of those plans. Are they indicative, or would compliance with those plans be intended to be a, a condition of, the, of any approval that we might give today? Uh, yeah. Thank you. So the proposed indicative plans uh, would be approved documents. Um, so they they were being yeah, they, they were included um, on, the, on the decision notice um, together with the the detailed site access plan um, as well. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Sorry, I'm just going to clarify the point that was made there because we've we've got that it is, but also the word indicative plans were used, which would indicative would suggests that actually we're not um, adopting as it is. So I do have some comments, Chair, but if you would allow, can we clarify that first, please? Yeah, that's fine. I think Chris Carter's about to Thanks, Chair, help us yeah. out. I think that might just be um, slightly misspoken by Guy there. So the, the parameter plans would be included and in, uh, any detailed scheme would have to comply with those. They're not indicative. They would be approved plans. There is an indicative layout included, which Guy put on the screen. That would not be included uh, as an approved plan. That's just to show how a scheme could come forward. So to clarify, with in that area, the houses go, but where they go in that area is for a later debate. Um, that's what I thought it was. They got thrown off there yeah. a little bit. Um, yeah. So yes, right, back to what I was originally going to say. Um, I, think, I, th I think actually that that level of, of housing probably will fit in some way. I do think that from the indicative plans, things do need to move along more and there does need to be some improvements. Um, but it does sound that those are, are being picked up and addressed. Um, I would stress on a wider basis that um, I think the, the word is quite often used of landmark building, that, um, that we don't just think a landmark building is something in a corner and very high. Um, it does seem to be a trend that's appearing, and could we... On a wider basis, please look at some perhaps more imaginative ways of, of making landmark buildings. Um, I think the, I would stress as well, obviously, the, the agent is here and, and can hear our concerns around the landscaping and the connectivity and, and things. So um, I would hope, Chair, that they're listening very carefully and taking that on board. Um, but I do think that level of, of development probably would fit within the parameter plan somehow. Great, right. and I can see the agent feverishly writing at the back of the room, so I'm sure it's been taken Eight lots of notes. We remember <laughs> what we say. Um, Councillor Richard Williams, please. 
Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I wasn't quite expecting that. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think that the proposed development works out at about 40 dwellings per hectare, I seem to remember, in, in the plan. So it doesn't, I think, um, seem to be problematic that we could have that number of houses um, in, in that area. Um, I, I was actually going to make the point, so I, I will slightly repeat it, but um, I will make the same plea. Uh, my heart sinks when I hear the word landmark building because it is inevitably a very tall building and I'm a little bit dismayed if the pressure for landmark buildings is coming from within the planning service or the, or the design team. Um, so I, I don't really think you know, developments like this need landmark buildings if we're talking about four-storey buildings. So, um, But I think really that's something to be dealt with at the reserve matters application as to what actually comes forward. But as as, as it stands, I, I think that number of houses would fit there. Um, and it seems to me a, a well together, a well put together proposal for this stage. Great, thank you. Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my comment is to do with, oh, before I forget, paragraph 21, with traffic flow meddling. I think they meant modeling, not meddling. Although traffic does meddle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kind of concerned about paragraph 22, actually, um, where 22 and 23, talking about the modelling of um, traffic at the junctions. Um, the pedestrian phase is not likely to be called every cycle, so lower flows are acceptable. This is paragraph 22, the last one. Uh, I thought we wanted to make pedestrian um, have priority over cars, so why is that statement acceptable? And paragraph 23, the southbound junction with Stirling Road is modelled at overcapacity. Already, <laughs> right from the bat. Uh, hello, why are we doing this? Mr Carter's going to attempt to answer that one. Uh, I'll give it a go, Chair. Um, Guy may want to chip in. But um, so with regard to um, the first point, um, I, I read that as um, based on the number of pedestrian movements, we're not anticipating that for each cycle of the vehicular traffic lights, there would be pedestrians wanting to cross. It's not that they're being discouraged. It's just that they wouldn't necessarily be there. Uh, and therefore, it wouldn't be every time the lights changed, you'd also have to wait for pedestrian crossings to take place. So you would get through more than one uh, rounding of the lights for each arm of the access before there's likely to be pedestrians wishing to cross the road and, and introducing that extra element of, of delay. Um, with regard to the second point, uh, it looks to me like the, the scheme actually improves that situation, notwithstanding that the junction's already over capacity. You'll note that uh, it suggests that changes to signal timings are proposed which reduce the AMP to 124%. So whilst that's still over, uh, capacity, it, it, it does actually have the effect of reducing it, so it's not actually making any additional uh, impact on waiting times there in a negative sense. Thank you for that attempt. I think that's the theory. The point is it's still at overcapacity, as you rightly pointed out. Um, it, it's not, I don't see it as helping matters, to be honest. As long as it's over 100%, it's, it's a problem. Anyway, um, yeah. And the other thing I wanted to... Um, highlight is paragraph 35 um, still talking about so yeah transport stuff and road stuff the developer of this site will need to submit a scheme in accordance with the coordination station etc etc um, early consultation with local highways authorities highly recommended please please it is a plea you have to do that because there's there's issues with this uh, with this side. Um, that was paragraph 37, by the way. I just finally um, quoted. It it just shows that there are issues that need to be addressed and addressed properly. And we will make note, and we will come back to you on that one. You have been warned. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reed. I think you wanted to say something. Um, can I invite the planning case off to show the building heights parameter plan in the context of the comments from Councillor Richard Williams as to 
uh, being able to look at matters at reserve matters stage. Oh, is that possible? Uh, yes, Chair, I'll just share my screen quickly. Um, so, yeah, so you can hear, see here the um, Building Heights Parameter Plan. Um, so it shows development of up to four storeys for the, the landmark building. Um, uh, yeah, what's, what we're referring to as the landmark building um, on the station for road frontage. Um, that's uh, so, and then development of up to three storeys. Um, uh, sitting in it on the other side of the, the junction there. So uh, I think the intention there is to provide a, a stepped sort of frontage um, to, to help define uh, this sort of entrance into, into North State. Uh, always dangerous for a lawyer to become a planner. Uh, the point I was going to say is that by having the parameter plan showing an area of the site of up to four storeys, it's going to be very difficult at reserve matters stage to reject a building which is at four storeys. And I just wanted to clarify that for Councillor Williams, Richard Williams' benefit. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dawson, please. Yeah, thank you. I don't want to labour this point, but it's the point that I raised first with them. Um, with the developers about the, the, the landmark building. Is it landmark in terms of its size or is it landmark in terms of its design? And that was my point, the importance of high quality design. But, but my main point here um, is the archaeology, uh, which is first mentioned on page 182, paragraphs 123 to 125, and then again on page 204, 270 to 274. Now, it makes clear um, that there are, that there is likely to be significant Roman fines here. Um, so I just want to be absolutely clear that this is covered, uh, comprehensively covered in the conditions. Um, and I, I think, as I understand it from the conditions, this is for officers to deal with. But clearly, thinking of the fines that were on the Mali side, we want to be very careful about this. Thank you. I don't know if... Guy, do you want to come back on the archaeology conditions? Uh, yes, so uh, it says correct. There is uh, anticipated to be uh, archaeological finds within the site, um, and condition 18 is proposed, um, which uh, will secure a, a written scheme of, of investigation um, um, prior to the development of the site, and that will be agreed with the, the county council's um, archaeology team. Um, and that'll that'll set out how the site will be investigated. So in terms of um, the the, uh, the, the the physical evaluation of the site, and also how how fines will be recorded um, and, and materials sort of uh, published in as well, uh, depending on on what is what is found uh, within the site. Um, <clears throat> in, in proposed condition forty, you talk about. Uh, producing uh, a 10% reduction in uh, um, having st sustainability strategy produce 10% reduction. Um, in view of the current COP um, discussions uh, uh, and so on, it's quite likely that the conditions, national policies would increase. Um, can the condition be uh, sufficiently flexible that if um, that we are bound by future conditions or we can uh, tighten them up later, should the... Uh, context be uh, changed in the future? I think Chris Carter is going to answer that one. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear me say the answer to that question is no. Um, the, the, the condition uh, reflects the current local policy situation. That's the basis on which we have to make the decision. So whilst we can encourage the developer to go beyond that, um, that sets the minimum baseline for what we'd expect to see. Um, as you may have heard from other developers, lots of them are looking to go beyond that. Um, and it's a case of policy catching up with reality, I think, sometimes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Ripeth, please. One more thing that I just want to get really crystal clear in my mind, following on from what Mr Reid has just said. Is this our only opportunity to look at the design? Because the landmark building, because um, obviously at the moment we don't really know much about what this will look like, apart from it can go as high as four storeys. 
um, t for me, it's what type of building it looks like and, you know, how it will be presenting in that landmark location um, and its design, not just the size of it and the height of it. Sure, my understanding is design is a reserve matter that we looked at at the detail stage, but I'm sure officers can confirm that. That's correct, Chair. We're looking at the principle of development here um, and the parameter plans would set out the principle of a building of that height, four storeys in height in that location, but the precise yeah. detail, design, uh, etc., would come forward as reserve matters later. Thank you. I just wanted to re-confirm um, myself <laughs> that the, uh, nothing had changed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to come back. Um, on the basis of Mr Reid's uh, very helpful clarification, therefore, could I ask the case officer um, about how that A4 storey building would sit in that location? Specifically, um, are there any other buildings of that height in the surrounding area? I noticed from the map there is a development, there's a sort of industrial unit immediately to the south, I think, and then there is some more housing beyond that. Are there any other buildings of a, a, that sort of scale in that area? Mm. Guy, I don't know if you can help flesh that question out. Uh, yes, so I think currently, um, I don't believe there are any four-storey uh, buildings within the immediate vicinity of the site. Um, if I just share my screen quickly, um, So this shows from the uh, coordination statement with the proposed development, um, uh, the Homes England Phase 3B and Digital Park Development. So um, they, they indicate that uh, four storey buildings um, are, are likely to come forward, uh, potentially will come forward um, along uh, in the within the digital park site and also within the Phase 3B. So it's it's about developing a um, sort of a range of, of heights uh, within, within sort of the proposed Northstow, um, sort of this, the western side of Northstow, and and developing its sort of uh, its sort of townscape really, and, and so the the four storey heights along uh, proposed for this site along the station road front should have been uh, sort of developed in, within that sort of within that framework, if that if that um, makes sense. I think we also have some, uh, Mr Carter would like to come Chair, it's probably worth also bearing in mind the wider context of this part of Northstow. So the opposite side of Station Road will have the Enterprise Zone, uh, the local centre for Phase 1. So the character of the area is going to be quite quite dense, quite different to what it is now. Uh, and so certainly in my opinion, I, I'd agree with the case officer, the four-storey building in, in this location in the fullness of time will, will probably not be noticeable because of, of the context of everything else that's going to be constructed around it. Okay, thank you for that. Members, I've no further... One more. Councillor Hawkins. Sorry, thank you for letting me come back. Uh, paragraph 69, foul drainage. We have the usual foul drainage is in the catchment of overwater and it does not currently have capacity to treat the flows from this development. However, Angla Water is obligated to accept it and take steps if we grant planning permission. When this comes back, can we have some sort of statement as to exactly what it is they're going to do to get the capacity for this development? Please, we are forever going through this loop and we end up with problems further down the line, <laughs> you know, like we have in Linton, for example. You know, it's a headache. We end up with a headache. We don't need a headache. Can we please have a statement from Anglia Water as to what exactly they're going to do? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Reid, you wanted to come in. Um, if, if I may, Chair, thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment. Um, two, two matters. I just want to check that, uh, having regard to Para 285, page 206, and the summary heads of terms immediately above, that members are happy that they have sufficient detail as to the tariff base of many of the contributions which currently aren't reflected in the table above. So are you happy that, um, as per the recommendation, that that can be dealt with in consultation with the 
Joint Director of Planning. And two, can I ask for you to specifically endorse um, that indexation should run from the date of resolution if you were minded to approve today? Okay, not sure how to handle that one, but I'm, I'm sure. I think the answer is probably yes, I think. Uh, if I'm, yeah, I think, Chris, can you help me with this one, please? Yes, Chair. So uh, the, the second point is hopefully the straightforward. So that's just confirming that um, any indexation of any Section 106 payments uh, would run from today. So any increase in those costs would, would uh, be calculated from the date of resolution to grant permission, should that be what the committee resolves to do. Uh, rather than it being, say, uh, from the date at which the Section 106 agreement is signed, which may take some considerable time more. Um, the second point, I think, is just to clarify that the table that um, Guy showed on the screen during his presentation, which set out the tariff-based approach uh, to uh, establishing what the Section, Section 106 contributions would be, uh, is endorsed by the committee. That is slightly different to what's in the table in, uh, in the report. Uh, that reflects the indicative mix that was put forward, um, but of course that's indicative, so we don't know the exact mix at this stage. So uh, once we know the mix of one, two, three, four bed properties, etc., uh, that uh, final section 106 contribution would be calculated based on a tariff, um, and those tariffs were shown by Guy earlier, so it's just confirming the committee's agreement to that. Well, I suppose, members, if we do have any concerns around agreeing that, I think it's probably the best way other than now. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you. I was just wondering if the officer could put that back up on the screen, because I must admit at the time the text was a bit small. I couldn't see it. I assumed it was the same as what was in the pack. Guy, are you able to help? Uh, you should be able to view that on the screen now. Yes, we can see that now. Chair, if I may. So what I'm just highlighting is that you'll see, for example, in the secondary education that uh, you've got a range of contributions which will go up to either from nil for a one-bed property, details not set out on that schedule, but it would go up to £21,612 for a four-bedroom dwelling, uh, similar arrangements in relation to primary and early years. And then just to highlight that uh, in relation to the outdoor sports contribution, that will be calculated on a tariff base by reference to dwelling size. And, and I think the point Mr Carter made is that that's not really reflected by the table on page 206 of the report. So I want to be clear that members are comfortable that what they're approving is not the table on page 206, but will be a tariff base to be agreed with the Director of Planning. Okay. Councillor Harvey, I believe you had a comment. Thank you, Chair. I was looking at um, the biodiversity calculations, and particularly on page 180, so paragraph 103, um, and it, it concludes saying, therefore, if the applicant cannot provide a minimum of 10% biodiversity net gain across both area and hedgerow units and within the boundary of their site, off-site provision should be provided. And I just, I just wondered whether that should underline the desirability of providing that within the locality if it can't be provided within the site itself. Yeah, I'm not, is there a question there? <laughs> Mike, please. Whether that should should actually have a sort of advisory attached to it, because it seems to be um, kind of giving permission at this early stage to sort of offsite the biodiversity, um, the required deficit, if you like, which um, might not be the best solution. Okay, um, Mr. Carson. Thanks, Chair. I think um, the principle is that, uh, in the first instance, you seek to provide it on site, obviously. Um, but what, what that secures is that if it can't be provided on site for whatever reason, that it is secured off site. Um, and the point is taken that um, as nearby as possible would be preferred. 
Um, but that detail wouldn't wouldn't be known at this stage, unfortunately. But that that's the principle of the, of the approach that would be taken anyway. Sort of daunting, please. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go back to Mr. Reed's comments concerning the table, because I'm not quite sure I understood his question to us. Um, and because the, obviously, I think what you're saying is that the information that's in this table on the screen is quite different from the figure that's given here. Um, and I'm not sure, how, are you directing us? I, I, can, see, I can see Mr. Carter um, understands my yeah, confusion. I think I hope you, Chris, can clarify. So, so the table that's in the report is informed by the same information that's on the screen in front of you. Uh, the table that's in the report sets out what the contrib contributions would be based on the indicative mix that's been put forward. What Mr. Reid is highlighting is that because this is outline and that mix is indicative, uh, it could change. And if it changes, it's the same tariff basis that's on the screen in front of you that would be used to calculate that contribution. So the the... the the cost per unit, for, for want of a better term, doesn't change. It's just um, once you know the mix of dwelling types, then you settle on your final figures. Okay. okay. So, Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just to sort of confirm that I'm personally happy with the, the tariff system as on screen, just in case um, um, Mr. Reid was actually asking us to confirm that we're okay with this. Um, so, so that's um, that on its basis, and I think the um, doing the indexation from today is, you know, that's very sensible. Um, just on Councillor Harvey's point around when things go off site, I just wondered whether maybe an informative. I don't think we can condition it's something along what we do with the um, we do the cascade, don't we, on exception sites and things like that, where initially it goes in the location. Then it goes, I think, up to five miles nearby. And you have to seek every opportunity before you look further away. And just whether um, a sort of a cascade approach would be would be more um, appealing to members. So that way we try to get things as close as possible. Uh, I'm not sure if officers have a, a view on that approach to the biodiversity provision. Well, perhaps Councillor Hawkins, maybe. Point, if I may. In the uh, quality panel's report on page 242, there is a paragraph that talks about uh, the panel insisted that this should provide the basis for, but as, uh, sorry, the proposed landscape has been pushed to the outside edges and there is little, if any, biodiversity gain. And so the panel thought this is a weak landscape scheme and did not support the idea of offsetting biodiversity gain off site. So that is not something recommended uh, by the panel, and we should, you know, whether it's uh, informative or whatever it is, um, ensure that this is followed, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Thank you. Mr. Carter? Thanks, Chair. Through you, just to highlight again, um, the timing of that report obviously was before, uh, as Mr. McEwen said, um, some quite substantial changes were, were made to the scheme. So. I think officers would be of the view that um, it, it may now be possible, but I think it's a, it's a fallback that if it isn't, obviously we want to make sure it's secured somewhere. Um, but obviously there is also condition 14, um, which is the landscape and eco ecological management plan condition, um, which would again will inform uh, those elements um, of the scheme. Thank you. Okay, sometimes wordings um, can be interpreted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yep, so. Okay, thank you for the clarity. Carter, uh, Councillor Hawkins, I have you down to speak. I think was that, was, that was, was what that I was the going to speak on. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, members, do you have any further comments in the debate at this stage? No? Okay, well, I, I, haven't, I haven't heard anyone speak against this item, so I'm going to ask if we can take the recommendation, which is on page 163, which is we grant subject to completion of a 106 agreement conditions and, and informatives if we can take that by affirmation or if anyone wishes to have a vote on this. So, yeah, can we, does anyone wish to vote against this or abstain? No, so can I take it by affirmation that this is agreed? Agreed. Mumble of agreement, so yeah, we will take that as approved unanimously. Thank you very much, everybody. Members, do we have one more in us or do we want to take a lunch break? Yeah. <laughs>
Right, I'm getting brakes shouted at me from all angles, so I think we'll take a lunch break now. If we take uh, around, yeah, if we come back at quarter past, which is around 40 minutes, um, so everyone's back in their chairs and ready to restart at quarter past two, then hopefully we'll be able to get through the rest of the agenda then. Thank you, everybody.